eventually end up on YouTube. Sorry, Lord. My name is Lord And somebody has an echo. Not anymore. Uh, today is Thursday, September 12th. We're coming back after a five week vacation because uh, we took one meeting off and then there were three weeks between August and September. Uh, my name is Carl Hummel. I'm chair. The commissioners will now introduce themselves. Bob Sweet. I'm Susan Cahale. Leah Whiting. And uh, we are expecting one commissioner online and one absent. So we'll see. We'll have the others introduce themselves if they show up. Um, normally we would have good and welfare for the public, but since we have a busy schedule with public hearings and professional staff here for other matters. I'm going to yeah. defer that until later in the meeting. Uh, so we'll start with the first public hearing for 10 Old Taft Avenue. Mm -hmm. Come on up. Uh, this is a request to amend the order of conditions to include construction activities associated with the retaining wall not included in the original NOI. Uh, this is DEP number 218-0823. We did a site walk this morning. Myself, Isabella, and Bob Sweet were there. So I'm hoping we can get this along pretty quickly. So uh, your introductory statement. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Cavalieri with Carrier and Hellman and the applicant and property owner, Gregory Lambert, um, who were on the site walk this morning. Since we last met, uh, the concern was the retaining wall that was constructed and was included in the original order of conditions. So we have since filed for an amended order of conditions. Plan shows the location of the retaining wall, where it was done, um, out on site, the bank flags that were uh, located in the field by a chassis screw, and the dock, the floating dock that's out there. And we're requesting to amend the existing order of conditions to include the retaining wall that was built, uh, showing that it's outside of the bank areas, uh, no impacts to the abutting recent resource areas that are out there uh, to amend it. And then uh, we did propose some stones around uh, the edge of the, uh, the retaining wall just to mitigate some of the sand that's uh, running off during some of the heavier rains. We showed some of those areas uh, on the plan when we were out there uh, on the southern side. Retaining wall slightly goes over the property boundary talked about putting some additional stone in that area as well to minimize the erosion with the sand that's out there. We'll have a conversation with the potter at number 12. And that's about it. Bob, do you have any observations from the site walk this morning? No, it was a it was a good site walk. Um, the the things that uh, we noticed there that we've addressed and and uh, Will be taken care of, so I have um, confidence that it's going to be done in a good way. Okay. Um, do you have any concerns or questions about the amended uh, paperwork and just the other documentation? Just make sure make sure that they follow Isabella's um, notes here. Yep. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> questions from the audience about this site. Okay. Uh, one of the concerns I did hear was from the abutter on the other side, on the northern side. He is going to be getting some surveying done. And basically, I said that if his surveyor comes up with a different idea of where the boundary is that would affect the wall, we have to, when we are listening to your uh, proposal and, and viewing your permit application tonight, we have to use the surveyor that you had who's licensed and whatnot. So if in the future the surveyors disagree, that would be a civil matter. And if it, you would hopefully be able to resolve that. And then if there are any concerns, one or the other of you might come back here. But our goal tonight is to settle it based on the documentation and the surveying that we have already. Thank you. Um, all right, Isabella, do you have anything to say? Are you comfortable with it? Okay, so I'll entertain a motion. I will make a motion to approve the request for an amendment to the order of conditions for 10 Old Taft Ave, DEP number 218-0823, and issue an amended order of condition 
conditions as drafted by the agent. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Uh, I don't have anyone online, so I can do a voice vote. All in favor? Dr. Oh. Peter, are you on? I don't know if he's the P, but. <laughs> Well, if he's not hearing us and can't respond, he's not it's part of the part of the meeting. Yet. All right. So, uh, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Bye bye. Do I? Leah. Well, I guess I'm doing a roll call vote then. Anyway, okay. And chair chair is voting aye as well. So it's passing unanimously. Congratulations. I'm glad your long ordeal is over, and now you're. You're, you're out of your I appreciate of here. everything that happened here. And Thank your you next step much. is to get a boat permit, a dock permit, I mean, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's in the works. I need this permit first before yep. I can go get that. Permit. So you can work with Isabella and getting it out. Okay. Thanks, guys. Great. You're going to try to get that stone in this weekend? On or at least on one side? On the, on the, yes. Looking at the lake on the left side. Correct. This weekend. You know what's going on on the right side. So. Just, just trying to get as much done. Uh, so that we can stop any any sand or or yeah. infiltration. I'll, I'll, that the left side will be done. Okay. Very good. Um, the right side will. Then we'll get to the it Won't be me stopping it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Uh, next to agenda oh. item number five: notice of intent for Route 16, DEP number 218-0853. Applicant is the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. The representative is the HNTB Corporation. We have people online for that. Okay. And be before that, I see we have Tim McCarty on on online now. So Tim, can you unmute and introduce yourself? Yep, Tim McCarty. So we'll be doing roll call votes now. So uh, yes, uh, your initial presentation. Yes, um, so this is Marissa Seifert from h and um, Tonight we also have Kevin um, with us from MassDOT. Um, last time we were with you, we presented um, an overview of the project. Um, since then, we did receive MassDEP comments, um, which we submitted some um, responses um, for the uh, commission to look at. Um, at this point, I think we've answered all the DEP comments, unless you have further concerns um hopefully um answer any following questions you that you have and i'm happy to go through the dp comments one by one if that's easiest for you i think going through one by one is oh, good. okay yeah sure yeah, I, I i look through them a lot of them are going to be uh order of conditions but the first two are kind of technical sure. so we should make sure people are comfortable with them sure um all right. Can you put this up on the screen, the 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 uh the comment log. Do you want me to do that, Marissa, or do you want to do it? Um, I have it up if you want me to do it. Yep. Let me know when you can see it. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So uh Mass UP commented that several of our resource areas had changed. Um based on when we did it back, I think it was 2020 um, to 2024. The reason these changed was really, we had a, we had a um, crappy GPS unit. Um, so we went back out there, we re-delineated the lines and made sure the resources were accurate with our new GPS unit. Uh, but that was basically the reason for the change. Um, we fully acknowledge our GPS was not good back during the original delineation. Anyone on the commission have questions or comments about uh, comment log item number one? Okay, move on to number two. Um, so Mass DP recommended that we have additional erosion controls that provide inlet protection um, for the existing and proposed catch basins, such as silt stacks. We actually are doing um, drain inlet protection for all the existing proposed drainage um, throughout construction, and that was shown on sheet 36 of the plan set. That we provided. Um, so we are doing that, in fact. Questions? Okay, on to number three. All right. Um, number three is there were 
it did not, we didn't submit test pit um, information with the submission. Um, however, we did do test pits, um, which we've provided in this packet. Um, and there, Mass DEP was asking us to demonstrate the, the design and sitting criteria outlined for the bioretention areas and the rain gardens in chapter two, volume two of the stormwater handbook was met. Um, and basically it was asking us that we need to confirm the depth of the groundwater and bedrock is at least two feet and a mounting analysis would be required if less than four feet. Um, so the test pits were calculated. Um, we have a groundwater depth of 10 feet. And so we're assuming that it's around four feet is where the groundwater is. For the second basin, um, we did not encounter any bedrock. Um, and essentially that the groundwater is at least six feet in that location. Um, and then we added, my apologies, I didn't show the grading on the plan set. We have attached grading plans for the BMPs to the comment response log as well. Between this and the Hastings Street project, I'm getting an education what mounding is and what a mounding analysis <laughs> is, but I'm still going to let other people to come up with the technical analysis of it. So Bob, Isabella, are you, did you look at the, the, the this and do you think it needs further review or is it, the numbers look good? The test pits show greater than four feet, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, what made you assume the, um, the one groundwater being four feet more than the test pits? I'm just trying to find it here. Yeah, I think it was just based off the test pit locations um, that it was approximately four feet. Um, I'd have to get back to you exactly why I'm not a drainage engineer. Our drainage engineers did this um, for further, but based on the test pit, I think it's about four feet or greater than four feet. Marissa, where is this? Um... Drainage basin. Is this the one that's coming down Route 16 towards Muddy Brook or? Yes. So this is the first one here. So this is the one that is not Muddy Brook. It's the other end of the project area. It's on um, by. Uh, what is it? After. Thank you. Right. Yes. It's on, the, it's on the right hand side of, of Route 16 going towards Uxbridge. Correct. Yes. Yep. We didn't walk that side of the road. We stayed on on the south side. I'm assuming it's going to have the greatest impact would be the one that goes to Muddy Brook. Okay. This you is the one that goes to Muddy Brook here. And this is the BMP2. So we know groundwater is at least, it's greater than six feet in this location. Do you have any questions or would your question impact us from making a decision tonight? I don't think so. Okay. Some, yeah. Okay. Well, if it does come back, we'll move on to the next item, number four. Um, so the applicant proposes temporary and permanent impacts to BLSF, land underwater, riverfront, and bank. Um, the KIP mission may consider incorporating restoration plans um, on a monitor monitoring period of two years on 75 cyber. Wow, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied reading these. I apologize. 75% survival rate of planted vegetation as a special condition in the order of conditions, um, if approved to be considered in compliance at the time of issuing the COC. Um, we are doing restoration in the BLSF and it's overlapping with bank, RFA, and, um, and the buffer zone. We will be loaming and seeding with a native upland seed mix. And then any temporary area will also be um, planting with a native seed mix, but we're happy to have that as a condition. When 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 that gets written as a condition, Leah, if you can work with Isabella and come up with the seed mix that you think would fit in with this particular habitat. Yeah. Um, we're, we yes, we, we can't already. Name, no, no, we can't name a specific company or seed mix. No, but, but if like, you can if you can yeah. review what their plan is. Yep, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Massa okay. just to, oh sorry, just to add to that, Massa does have standard seed mixes um, that are all native species, and we're happy to provide those as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, next one, number six. Five. Um, oh, five. Sorry, <laughs> jumping ahead on me. Um, oh. 
just confirming that there's no BVW impacts um, around Muddy Brook and there's not the wetlands set back um, and we'll have erosion controls placed in between um, all the work and the BVW area associated. So no, there will not be any impacts there. Questions? Um, I do have a quick one. So in, when you're working to do the color into the water or whatnot, um, will you be planning on maybe uh, somehow keeping the freshwater, because uh, freshwater fishery, cold water fishery, sorry, excuse me, you know, keeping this, you know, like using a fish crawl or whatnot or keeping them away from the so we do have a stream bypass system set up. Um, we'll leave that to the contractor to come up with any additional fish sort of, you know, preventions or anything like that. But we do have a stream water bypass, so water will continue to flow. That'll go around the area, so they won't be impacted. Correct. Yep. Okay. NHESP also conditioned it for no work between April 1st to May 31st, and that would be migration period. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Uh, now we're up to six. Okay. Um, this is just asking us to have an operations and maintenance plan. Um, just got me. It's basically just asking us to provide the operations and maintenance plan. Um, we will have an operations and maintenance plan incorporated with the stormwater po pollution prevention plan that will go in with our NIFTES permit. Um, we're happy to provide. Um, that plan once we have it um, to the commission. Will that will that uh, operation oh, oh, operations and maintenance plan be overseen by the Menden Highway Department? No, so that would be MassDOT because it's a MassDOT owned road. Okay, so if if we discover something and we if we have a copy of the plan, then we can look. If we get a phone call that there's something going on. And then we would be able to call up Mass Highway and say, we think you need to execute this part of your operations plan. Is that the way it would work? OK, yep. so then we should have a copy in our office then, yes. Yeah. Could we include that as a condition then? Yeah. OK, uh, any further input? OK, number seven. Number seven is just an illicit discharge statement um, should be provided to Mass DEP and the commission. Um, we attached one to the submission. Um, I don't know if you want me to flip to it um, now, but it is included in that packet. No, I, I looked at it. Um, and, and the other thing I wanted to put on the record is we, when we were doing the site walk, there was some question about the, uh, a pipe that we discovered on the parcel. What's the, what's the address that we were looking at? Uh, it should be building 47, right. uh, 49. And that's not considered an illicit discharge because you're grandfathering in anything that's already pre present. I believe so. Yes. All right. So I just, so I just wanted to make sure that that pipe isn't considered an illicit discharge because we're getting it grandfathered in and we have called attention to it and we know it's there. Okay. Right. Any any other questions? Okay, uh, number eight, the last one. This was just the conditions placed by NH NHESP, um, and it's essentially a time of year restriction between uh, on in water work from April one to May thirty first, and we will one hundred percent comply with that condition. Questions. So my summary of this is as a result of the comment log from uh, Mass DEP and also Fisheries and Wildlife, items number four, five, six, and eight will result in Isabella adding conditions to the order of conditions template that we are using. Uh, does that match up with what you're expecting? Yes, yes it does. Okay. Uh, the other ones, items number one, two, three, and seven are informational where you were asked to provide information and you have already done so in the packet. And you will be, well, yeah, six, you'll be providing us with another round of information, but that'll be part of the order of conditions. Yep. Okay. 
Uh, Tim, do you have any questions uh, before we uh, close discussion uh, from the commissioners? Oh, he's not unmuting himself. Uh, anyone in the audience wish to comment on the Route 16 project? Okay, uh, we'll close discussion and I'm ready for a motion. Someone read it. I will make a motion to approve notice of intent for Route 16, DEP number 218-0853 and issue an order of conditions as drafted by the agents. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, since we now have people online, we'll do a roll call vote. Tim McCarty. Uh, Tim, Tim, my. Okay. Bob, I. Sue, Sue, I. Leah, I. Chair votes I, so that also passes unanimously. So. Um. Thanks a lot. Wait, do we? So I didn't have the order drafted for tonight. We have 21 days to issue it. Yep. Do you want to review it at the next meeting or do you want to do the boilerplate with the other conditions? I'm comfortable with you uh, doing your doing what you normally do so awesomely and efficiently if getting it to uh, anyone else that feel the need to review it at our next meeting. Okay. Great. So, nope, just uh, write that up and uh, along with the other things that we discussed as part of the comment log. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yep. Okay. All right, we can now move on to agenda item number six. Notice of intent for 100 Park Avenue, DEP 2180854. This is for uh, multi year Fragmites control uh, beaver pond on Wigwam Brook with water and wetland uh, doing the actual treatment. So we have some DEP comments that just came in and some, uh, some. Uh, Fisheries and wildlife, NEPA, some other comments. So, uh, Colin, can you uh, make your opening statement? And we'll talk about what, what the feedback is that we've got. Yep. Hello. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Colin Goslin, uh, water and wetland. <clears throat> um, so, uh, last year we made a uh, site visit, Ann and I, out to the Meadowbrook um, uh, wetland area. And um, luckily, they kind of caught the infestation of the Phragmites real early. It's about a 10 by 20 um, stand kind of right directly in the middle of the uh, wetland marsh. Um, so, you know, it's it's very difficult area to access, but it's it's prime habitat for the Phragmites. How it got out there, we don't know. Um, but, you know, what we're kind of proposing is, you know, we go out there, um, you know, using backpack full foliar spray, it, um, you know, possibly some hand wiping, um, you know, just to kind of control it so it doesn't spread. It's it's perfect area for, um, you know, if we waited a few years, um, no doubt, it, I think it would take over the whole wetland area. Um, it's a it's a really nice area. Um, you know, you got to walk. I think it's like a quarter mile through a trail to access it. But um, you know, once it starts expanding, it, it would it would definitely take over. So, you know, we're just trying to limit impact on the natives out there, control it, and, you know, hopefully that natives uh, kind of have a chance to take back over control. Okay. Um, I have a question. Leah, yep. Colin, what are you going to use as a foliar spray? Uh, we're going to use a, a Mazapir um, okay. herbicide. It's kind of very selective to the plant. Uh, won't won't touch any of the. Uh, you know, it will. It won't touch any of the uh, the natives out there. Hopefully. Okay, and as far as hand wiping, are you still going to use the amazapir? Yep. I mean, if it's super, if it's like mixed in with the woodies, we would. Um, okay. But right now, it's kind of a dense monoculture, so we'll probably just uh, foliar backpack spray it. Okay, and you don't plan on cutting and then spraying, or or dripping. No, I mean, that's that's really tough, time consuming. Um, 
we've found, you know, as long as the permit gets issued in a timely manner, this is like the perfect window for it. Um, okay. Works great. So. You're planning on doing that before the end of September, I'm guessing. I mean, the protocol is you got to get in there before the uh, first deep hard frost. Right. We're trying, you know, we're using a systemic herbicide, uh, kind of tricking the plant. You know, right now it's taking all of its starches into its roots, so we want the herbicide to translocate into the roots and actually kill the plant. Um, you know, after the first hard frost, it's it's useless. Before that, um, it's really hard to control. So right now, to mid October is pretty much the the, the perfect window. One of the other letters that we got was from, uh, I forget which agency, but they said that there were definitely endangered species that would be put at risk by the treatments. Uh, can you say more about that and how you're going to protect uh, those species? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've never seen, um, I didn't see the comments, but w what we're using, we're using foliar spray. Um, the product that we're using is actually um, DEP registered for in water treatment at you know significantly high, higher rates so what we're using is minimal rates not getting in the water um so the, the, we've seen no impact to uh, endangered species you know fish frogs um any you know flora fauna um we've never had any issues we, we deal with this product on a much higher level um you know gallons per Per acre in the you know in the Nashua River watershed for water chestnut, uh, which is in water, which is there's a ton of um, endangered species out there. We work with DCR, uh, fish and wildlife, um, so there's no concerns that we have. They have so, um, as far as I'm concerned, this, I mean, it's it's the best best approach and only approach at this point. So, you know, the main concern, especially with Anne, is just we don't want this spreading. Uh, um, we're using such a small amount of herbicide. Okay, Anne, do you want to speak to this? I'm sure. I'm just looking at the National Heritage and Endangered Species Program comments. And what they say is in September, October, um, if st uh, standing water is present throughout the stand, the applicant may proceed to treat the Phragmites using hand wiping, stem injection, and backpack spraying of Isa Mox, is that what you're using? Clearcast? Correct. Yep. It says the standing water is not present throughout the stand. The applicant may proceed to treat the Phragmites only with hand wiping and stem injection. So I suppose if there's if it keeps on being so dry, then that might have to be the treatment, not the spraying. Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's fine. Um I'm sure with you know the lack of the rain that we have uh, either way it's such a small stand uh either either approach is feasible and that was a condition for this first year i talked with nhesp nhesp um in future years they'd prefer for treatment from uh june 15th to august 15th and i think you since you want to target in august or september probably later in earlier in september august and that's just due to the type of species found there and their breeding times. Um, so they did have conditions for years moving forward. If you wanted to treat outside of that June 15th to August 15th, we would need to submit an annual treatment plan for next year. For 2025 to 2028. OK, yeah, no, that's feasible. I mean, I think we can get at it with, within that window and if if not, we are, we're definitely willing to, you know, submit a treatment plan. And Colin, are you expecting that we'll need to be treating for another couple of years after this application? Um, probably. I mean, it might be a three year process, but um, I think we'll we'll know a lot more after this year. I'm happy to share our notes. We'll kind of take some as we're out there. We'll take some photos, uh, some recommendations, and happy to. share share with the commission when that next would be year helpful. would you go on i said that would be helpful thank you when next year would you be able to make an evaluation if we needed to do another treatment next summer i uh, i think by june uh maybe we take a walk out there and kind of it'll it'll tell because the the um the growth should be popping up 
by May, you'll see the dead stands. Um, so I, I, th I think the it'll tell a lot by June. Okay. So the action item for CONCOM and Anne to do is next June after you do that evaluation is if we need an additional round of treatment, figure out which town budget is going to be paying for it and then make work with you to come up with the multi-year plan and then submit it to all of the appropriate state agencies. Thanks, CPA. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll CPA. make a note. <laughs> Sorry, go. CPA has some money set aside already and it's not tied to this fiscal year. Okay. So we're okay for the, the first year or two. The, the question will be, CPA money can get used to destroy something that's already there. It can't get used for ongoing maintenance. So the question that we'll have next June is which of those two things is going to be happening. I think that like for the CPA funds, like this is a project to get rid of the invasive species right. and we're going to do it. And so I, I think yeah. that that's legitimate CPA funding. If yeah. we needed more money, we'd have to go to town meeting. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it's a legitimate use. But you know, but not to do it for ten years, you know. No. No, um, if, if, if we if we come up with a three year plan next <clears> June <throat> that will eradicate it, any treatment after that three years would probably have to get would not be eligible for CPC. Is the way I would I would look at it. Mm. I'll put on my calendar too that like in May to get in touch with Colin and so so that we can take a walk out there and you could look at it and just you know find out what the situation is. Okay, uh, any other commissioners have questions on the DEP comments or the, uh, the, the other, the heritage letter? Okay, questions from the audience or online? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, so we're ready for another motion. Leah, you gonna be on a roll? Sure, okay. I make a motion to approve the notice of intent for 100 Park Street, DEP number 218-0854, and issue an order of conditions as drafted by the agent. Is there a second? Sorry, I will just jump in. Um, the other DEP comment was that there were no abutter notifications, but because this property is greater than 50 acres and the location of the treatment is outside of 200 feet from any other properties, it doesn't require a better notification. Okay. Just so that's addressed. Okay. So, second. Is there a second? Second. Oh, Tim. second. Okay, roll call vote. Tim? Tim, I. Bob, I. Susan, I. Leah, I. And chair votes I. So, this is also unanimous. We're on a roll. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Colin, you'll be able to work with Isabella on scheduling an actual time and uh, coming on out and getting the work done. All right, thank you very much. Have a nice night, guys. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. On to agenda item number 7, 26 Asylum Street, DEP number 218-0856, uh, repair of a septic system. Uh, is there David Pomeroy, Margaret Bacon ecosystem? People here for that? Yes. Okay, your opening statement. Okay, uh, Margaret Bacon uh, representing uh, David Pomeroy here, and I'm, we're just requesting a permit to uh, repair uh, an existing failed septic system. Uh, I met out on site with the chair and the, the agent uh, yesterday morning. Uh, to go over the site. I don't know if you want me to uh, share the screen there, Isabella. Yes, or... yes, please. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, 26 Asylum Street, here's the existing house. Here's your existing well. Here are the wetlands. So I have to keep the system uh, outside the 100 foot well radius. Here's the 50 foot buffer. So there's really only one place that that system's going to go, and it's pretty much similar to where the existing system is now. And, and here's Asylum Street. So uh, I have erosion control in. 
so it's basically going to be a, uh, a gravity system with a, a Presby and Viroseptic. Uh, I did get uh, comments from the DEP. Uh, in, uh, he mentioned, uh, uh, it was Thomas Rubella, mentioned something about the riverfront area. Uh, I guess offside the, uh, outside the project limits, there is a stream, but every time I've been by that stream, it's been dry. But needless to say, under the uh, provisions of the Wetlands Protection Act, septic repairs are uh, exempt from the uh, requirements of the riverfront area regulations. And I did provide a copy of that part of the regulations as I responded to DEP. So basically, it's just a septic repair. It's uh, in failure and it needs to be replaced. Questions from the commissioners? Is the, um, it says it's 16 feet, five inches. Is that to the edge of the road or the, where, where does that well, measurement it, go it, to? It's, it, yeah, to the edge of the, uh, the, the, the edge of the pavement. 16.5. Oh, no, that's the actually, actually the, re the right of way where we think the right of way is. And we, uh, based the the property line based off of existing stone walls out there assuming that's the right of way which made sense when we mathematically put this property together so that's to the right of way not the roadway but what's the difference what's the right of way go to well you, you have the roadways probably about 18 feet wide the right of way is probably about 30 feet wide give or take. Sometimes it varies. Mm. OK. That's including the 15 foot on each side of the road. It is very close to it. And, and per Title V, you, you try to keep a septic uh, at least 10 feet away from the property line, if you can. A lot of times there's a rule of thumb where the center line of the road, 20 feet from the center line, is usually the taking of public ways. Further comments? When we did the site visit, we discussed um, drainage, stormwater coming down on the road and how it might, it, we, we saw some channeling. Can you say something about that? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, it, what, as you can see, everything slopes down this way and then it does spill into a uh, kind of a, a vegetated area before it, it flows into the woods. And this area was starting to get eroded. So I, I already talked to the contractor about that, and we're going to put in a just a uh, protect that area with just a, a some stone, uh, small six inch stone minus riprap just for scour protection, so it doesn't get any worse. And that and that was just in that that one little area here was the, the one area where we started to notice the the scouring. So that can easily be uh, addressed with just some, you know, small stone so that it's, you know, you can drive over it if you have to, but big enough so it's not going to wash away. Are you comfortable with Isabella having uh, something about that in the, the order of conditions? No, that's fine. That's okay. fine. And uh, staff comment, you wanted a, the site plan to be updated. Do you want that done before work or do you want it as an as built out? Are you able to update it with the riverfront area on? Well, it, 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 I guess why it, it's exempt from the riverfront area. I mean, I can take mass GIS where they show that that line, but I don't want to go over and put flag on somebody else's property. You know, I typically don't like to do that, and it's exempt from the riverfront area anyways. I, I don't know what we're going to uh, prove by uh, showing that on the plan. I mean, the, the whole area that's being disturbed is it's lawn and it's going to be lawn when we're done. No trees are coming down. It's up to the commission. Okay. What? I just think the only concern would be in depth, you know, to, to ensure that no erosion is going to be seen in the riverfront area. So. Okay. 
argue Susan, but it's uh, far, I think it's far enough back. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's going to be erosion controls anyway. So yeah, I can see that. that's going to. Okay. Happen. So we would we would not require an update. Uh, let's see the consensus. Just maybe that the erosion controls are biodegradable, but it's not in our. Uh, that's in the boiler. Too. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Tim, do you have any input? No, no, I think it looks like a good plan. I mean, it's a tight situation, so it looks like she's done the best that she could with what she has. So as long as the erosion control is in place, I agree. Okay, uh, any further discussion? Anyone in the audience or online? Okay, uh, time for a motion. So who's going to be making it this time? I make a motion <laughs> to continue the public. Oh, no, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Make a motion to approve notice the notice of attend for 26 Asylum Street, DEP number 218-0856, and issue an order of conditions as drafted by the agent. Is there a second? One second. Roll call. Tim I. Bob I. Two I. Leah I. And Chair I. So this also passes unanimously. Thanks, okay. Margaret. Thank okay, thank you. Much. Okay, that finishes the public hearing source of the section. Um, is Karis on? Not yet. Okay. Uh, I'll now see. Do people want to talk about uh, in the audience or online good and welfare for the public? This would be a time where we would express an issue of concern for the Conservation Commission. We would not be taking any action at this time. We would instead hear your feedback, and if necessary, or we felt it advisable, we would ask Isabella to look into it further, or we would uh, do other uh, discussion. Yep, come on up to the mic and introduce yourself, where you live. Hi, Wayne Bips, 45 Kinsley. Kinsley Lane. Um, we had our Lake Association meeting a couple nights ago, and we have been talking for quite some time about the purple loose stripe that's pretty much taking over our lake. Um, we've talked about it for a long time, and we think that it's about time to do something with it. So we reached out to um, Wet and Waterlands and asked for a quote on removing it. Um, and we got a cost of $1,500, which he suggested that we wait until next year for. Um, I guess our question is, is the town willing to uh, supplement any of that money for us, or, or should we just take it on ourselves out of our own, out of our own treasury? Um, the way I've seen this working in the past is you would propose a town meeting warrant item asking for the full amount. And then the, the town would decide yes or no. As part of the discussion, you were a representative from the Lake Association would stay up and say that you would be contributing to part of this. Then we'd hear from the PINCOM that any money that you contributed would then flow, the, the excess would get back into the general fund of the town. Okay. I believe that's the way we've done this kind of thing in the past. Okay. Uh, this would also be a, a good demonstration if you and other supporters came in and spoke in favor of the town meeting more and mm -hmm. item said, and we're putting our money where our mouth is, right. you're much more likely to have it right. pass. Yeah. Um, I guess it's a little too late to, uh, to, to, to do what we had hoped to do it this fall, but. Well, there's a November town meeting. You can try and get on the warrant for that. No, I think you need to take care it, of it. It would still be uh, it would still be spring. It was we're thinking springtime. Right. So if you if you if you got on the town meeting warrant for November and got the money budgeted, then we would have that for a spring treatment. Okay. There's a there's going to be a town meeting in Both November. Spring. Okay. So there is my my understanding is that there will be a town meeting in November. At some point, the select board will open the warrant. At that point, you would go and talk with uh, the town administrator and his, his the staff here about crafting a warrant item article. You could go back and look at how this was worded in previous years. Go talk to the FinCom about it and, and do the usual process of, of small town politics. <laughs> Excuse me, okay. Jim. Would they want to do that before November? Well, it's too late in the season 
to no, I'm talking talk to the town. Oh, got you. Uh, warrant articles are due around Columbus Day in October. But so. you, you wouldn't be able to pay out of our general fund because we have a Lake Nitmuck line item. Um, I'd leave that for our lake specialist to talk about it and, and we can have that discussion as an agenda item for our meeting second 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 meeting in September. So uh, come back and we'll we'll have that discussion about whether to allocate uh, any money that we have in the budget for it and then see about getting the treatment. But uh, I'd like to 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 encourage you to get something on the town meeting warrant and, and and let people in the town know Lake Nipmuc is an important resource. You have lots of people on the lake who are in favor of the motion and voting uh, and, and spread awareness of the situation. Okay, so you would like us to come back to your next meeting? Is my it sounds like right? we will have, a, have, have an agenda item to discuss using our money in our budget for this fiscal year, and you can participate in that then. Okay, good. Anything else? Okay, this will be year 2025, right? The one we're in now. Which would carry into the spring. Yeah. yeah. So as long as it's used before June 30th, which okay. falls into your your line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh I see Karis North Town Council is now on. So we will move to agenda item number eight. eight. Uh, 134 North Avenue enforcement order review and discuss soil boring results. I am recusing myself uh, from this matter. Normally, uh, Vice Chair Susan Cahalan would be running the meeting, but she is requesting that since Leah did that earlier this summer for several meetings, that Leah continue in that role. So as as chair in the absence of chair and vice chair, I'm delegating. Leah, so here, here's your gavel. Oh, good. And I'm off to the audience. Yeah. Okay, just a, a quick ground rule. Um, we all need to speak in a courteous and respectful manner, and that goes three ways. You have to speak to us that way. We will absolutely speak to you that way. And commissioners, let's speak to each other that way too. If I deem that you, you're not speaking in a constructive tone, you will lose your turn. If you just speak in a constructive tone, you know, put out in the audience would be a butter. <laughs> we know who that is. Um, and proactively, if anyone doesn't feel like they can abide by that, you can go sit with the a butter in the audience. So I think we're good with it. So other than that, um, and thank you for sending in your reports early. That was a big help. So I'll let you, whoever oh, well, wants thank to go you, first. Ms. May I proceed? Sure. Go thank you. It. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Adam Brodsky, an environmental lawyer. It's nice to see you in person rather than on the video. And I'm here on behalf of Route 85 Realty Corp, which is the property owner. Uh, you know Sean Reardon, our professional engineer with Tetratech, as well as Scott Goddard, our professional wetland scientist with Goddard Consulting. And you alluded to our submittal on September 3. Uh, we provided three documents, one of the soil testing log and report prepared by Goddard. Second, an existing conditions plan from Tetratech, which uh, depicts and proposes certain limits of the historic wetlands on the property, and three, a site plan from Tetra Tech describing our proposed wetland restoration. Uh, I'm just going to speak briefly, and then I'm going to hand it over to sure. the subject Absolutely. matter experts. Uh, from our perspective, we've got two objectives, uh, hopefully uh, to obtain at the appropriate time a vote approving our proposed limit of those historic wetlands, and second, a vote approving the restoration approach, and in particular, our replication ratio, with the understanding that with that information, we could then develop a written restoration plan, which would then be reviewed and approved by the commission. Um, as Sean will explain, we're proposing what we believe is a conservative limit of the historic wetlands on property in, in a desire to reach uh, an agreement with the Conservation Commission 
um, as uh, Sean will explain and, and Scott also, uh, at least from our perspective, we don't think that the uh, the identification of the limits of the historic wetlands are that clear cut here. And if I just uh, digress for a moment, because I, I'm just going to share an experience. I had a similar situation in another town where I represented a farmer who was accused of filling wetlands to create additional pasture for his his cattle operation. Um, both the farmer and the town had their own professional soil scientist, and they could not reach agreement as to when the land was filled or the limits of the historic filled wetlands. It resulted in years of litigation, which was actually resolved by a negotiated resolution. Um, and, and that's what we're hoping to achieve here this, this evening is to reach some agreement with the commission. The commission is, is comfortable and to avoid any any delay, any further delay in the resolution of, of this dispute. Uh, Ms. Genova did send to me late this afternoon an email from Mass DP. Uh, candidly, we haven't had a chance to digest it, um, and we're prepared to address those issues at the appropriate time. But I just wanted to express our uh, continued commitment to working with the commission uh, to resolve this matter to your satisfaction. So with that said, I'm going to turn over to Sean. Thank we you. just got those comments. Yes. Obviously, we would have given them to you way ahead if we had. I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting yeah. that some. No, 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 I just uh, full Ms. transparency. It's been wonderful to work with. She's incredibly responsive, yeah. um, which is not always the case. And so uh, we, we understand that you just received those. Um, but we'll have to consider those at some some other time, perhaps. But in any event, Sean. Yeah, sure. Again, Sean Reardon, Tetra Tech. I'm sort of been brought on to sort of help coordinate things a little bit as the engineer and a little bit just as the representative of the owner. Mm -hmm. so as, a, as a sort of a recap, when we originally came in here, we expressed, much like Adam said, just we want to sort of reach a conclusion that everybody thinks is fair and, and accomplishes the objectives. Um, and, and we're committed to doing that. Mm -hmm. um, in light of that, we tried to piece everything together, put a little bit of history and figure out when things got filled. What we do know is that there was absolutely about 4,600 square feet of fill that 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 we we as, ascribe to. We we know that that was our our work. Um, prior to that, it's a little bit murkier because all we know is is at or around the time that that the work was was being done, there was an inspection by a member of the CONCOM. So at, at some point in time, where that first initial work was done, there was some eyes on the site, which which lends us to believe that at that time that that you know there was reasonable certainty that there the, the wetland boundary that we had established the hay bale line that was visible in in aerial photographs was probably a, a decent representation of where that boundary was we were working towards that end and we sort of came up with a mitigation plan we went out on site and did a site visit time we discussed about doing some 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 borings as well um, with the idea of sort of getting a, a clearer picture um, we've done that work. Scott's going to present the findings um, and I'll come after Scott's done. I'll sort of explain to you sort of what we're proposing to do, which is far beyond what we originally proposed when we were originally thinking it was 4,600 square feet of impact. So with that, I'll just let Scott brief you on on what our findings were and what conclusions they led us to. And then I'll come back and tell you what we hope to do about. It. Yeah, so I, I wonder if it'd be useful to put up a graphic for display either on the screen or we also have a board just so we have something we can look at together. Is this of the soil that? results? I'm just yeah. looking at it on my computer. You want the plan or yeah. the? Yeah, the existing conditions plan is probably the best one. You have that plan. Yeah. You should all have a copy of that in your plan. That's what's up here. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for the existing plan. I see all the soil testing here. Do we have a plan of um, where the soil testing was done? Yeah, yes, it, it's on there. It's right on there. Well, on okay. the existing conditions plans, a series of symbols that call boring numbers B numbers. Mm -hmm. So, six. yeah, that's a great graphic for sure. So, so if you looking at this plan, I'll just stay in the theater, I guess. Is that okay to do? I don't think you're a mic, but it's okay. No, thank you. No, wait. Just be respectful. Okay. And constructive. Constructive. Don't forget so, that. So over here is the heavily deep ponded area for those who've been out there, right? And then 
what we did is did a series of geopro borings in some linear fashion projecting out from the edge of what is clearly wetlands. So we flagged the wetlands out there today, which is in this section in here, toe of the slope of the fill material that was placed. So this is the only useful for showing where the edge of alteration wetlands occurred. And once you get into this- Pardon section, me, Scott, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you reference the colors or the dotted and dashed lines? Because I can't see what I, you're pointing to. I would be happy so, to, yep. So in between you. flags on the plane, and in between flags, um, say one and, uh, no, sorry, eight and, between eight and 14, A8 to A14, where it says GC A8 to A14, that's the edge of flag wetlands in yep. between the red dashed line. Okay. okay. And Scott, the, the blue is the 25 foot That's no right. disturbed zone. The green is the is the 70 or the yep. 50 foot. So yep, exactly. the edge of the blue is the edge of the current wetland, as you okay. know. So those flags that start off at the left property line where it says GCA1 all the way down to GCA16 goes off site. That is what is the markings of the edge of the wetlands today. Mm -hmm. The portion from A1 to A7, A8 range is a natural transition from a natural wetland to a natural buffer zone. There's no changes in soils and vegetation. So that's outside of the footprint of impact. Then when you go from flag A8 to A14, that's 14 sits right at the bottom of the property line. That's the area that had impacted wetlands. So it's useful to show where those wetlands are today because then that's our measuring point um, for altered wetland extent. In other words, everything to the left of those flags is still a natural and thriving wetland. No additional fill is in there, no clearing of vegetation. It's standing water, it's a button bush, sort of uh, marshy condition. So then we said, okay, in the area where it was altered, looking at a combination of historic aerial photographs and site conditions, can we attempt to piece together where the wetland line may have been to then quantify the extent of uh, wetland alteration from the filling activity? So starting at uh, flag A9, that you can, there's a series of borings. That's that circle with the cross hatching in it that's partly black, partly white, little circles. There's a series of three dots in a row. See, you can read that one, but then it says um, 3B, 3C, so I'm just gonna say 3A and the, the dots here. So 3A, 3B, 3C in a line, and then it ends as you approach the tennis court. And if you rotate clockwise right about at flag A10, there's another linear series of borings also shown with a circular dot. And that's gonna say 1B, 2B, 3, 3, I'm oh, sorry, 1B, 2B, 2C, 2D, 2E, and that stops short of the utility building, also in a linear fashion. Think of these as like spokes on a wheel trying to explore uh, linear extents away from the impact area. And if you go down to A12, another series of borings, 4A, 4B, 4C, heading for the pool area. And then a final set down on the bottom of the sheet, starting again at flag 13, we have uh, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, heading for the uh, some small substructure that exists within it. So we tried to reach these spindles or these extensions wherever we had access without sort of being, while being conscientious of underground utilities and buildings and, and infrastructure. So in agricultural conditions, um, Soils can be hard to read in most cases. 
Uh, I've looked at many agricultural sites, including many in Menden. I've looked at many wetland alteration areas, even in Menden. And uh, what's traditional to find in, when you have an agricultural use historically, which this site has, reading the soils can pose a certain degree of challenges, as opposed to if you're, say, out in the woods, in a nice pine forest or or some somewhat undisturbed area, you're going to see more natural profile changes of the soils. So there are some hurdles to really nailing this down with a high degree of precision. And we're trying to piece together the data based on what's presented to us and then draw some reasonable conclusions using you know, reasonable data interpretations. So I'm not here to present to you that everything is exactly down to the, you know, to the inch of accuracy, but I am presenting to you that the approach taken here, you know, demonstrates a, a reasonable approach to interpreting the site conditions. So we submitted a report showing what these geopro borings look like. And when I say geopro, I mean that there was a, a small device out there that might look like something the size of a small smart car or something, or an oversized ATV. And it's attached to it is a um, a unit which can uh, basically pound down a boring, and it can draw up a core. The core is going to be a long cylindrical tube that's clear, and in that clear tube, you can see the soil. So it will grab, say, the first you know four feet, and then you pull that four feet up, lay it on the ground, and you can see it. And the, then the, the tube will go back in, grab the next four feet, pull that out. And after a series of borings, we can pull out, you know, four, eight, 12 feet of soil material, lay it out on the ground. We include photographs of, to the commission of what was found in there. There were some areas that were clearly wetlands. You know, whether it was or wasn't an agricultural use, there were areas that definitely exhibited strong wetland characteristics where you saw black organic soil conditions. And the ones that show those strong wetland conditions are everywhere that's internal to the dashed red line. So if you start on the bottom of the sheet, for example, boring 1A, 1B, 1C all had a zone of strong, dark, very black, mucky, organic material that would be very consistent with the soil material found beyond the flagging inside the wetland. So if I walked into this wetland and stuck a, a shovel on the ground, you would pull up a mucky type of a wetland, really just dark black, saturated, and indicative of strong hydric conditions. And that was also found in the upper zones of the natural ground. When I say the upper zones of the natural ground, I mean, you went through a zone of you know, three or four, you know, feet, something of that magnitude of clear fill material, which is what we see on the ground. So the grade here is a few feet higher than what it was. That's consistent with this retaining wall and the, the elevations of the ground relative down there. So we went through this zone of fill and rock. It was just kind of what you would anticipate to see. It was like a mixed loamy sand and rock and, you know, kind of had all that type of material in it. And then once you got through that, you would see a black zone. And that black zone was then usually underlaying with a strong gray type of a soil. So organic to gray would be indicative of, of wetlands. That was present here, here, and here. Then in, this, in the direction of the line, it says number four on it. So in 4A and 4B, that was also present. In, this, in the number two series line, it goes up to the utility building, 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D show those conditions, and then the most uh, northern one, serial 3A and 3B show those conditions. So this dashed red line was created as a result of reading that data interpretation, and it forced us to bump that line more uphill, up gradient, than the original interpretation that um, Sean and I came in to you uh, discussing. We had, had, had we had a line concept added down here before we did these borings. As a result of the borings, that line moved up 
substantially to capture an area of just over 4,400 square feet. The borings, when you go above those zones, start becoming more challenging to interpret. There's a, a difference between here. The strong organic layer starts to drop out. There's a lot more mixing of soil found. Of soil found. You don't find those classic traditional layers like you would in an undisturbed upland condition. A, a oak forest, a pine forest, because we, we, we didn't have that condition here prior to the work. So then we don't see a buried soil layer that matches that because that wasn't here. So that's where the soil logs become harder to read. But what we can say is that there is a clear distinction between this zone and this zone. And then we would expect it to be, of course, become more. Sorry, better. can I stop you for a minute again? Sorry, uh, yes. Yes, I, I'll, 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 I'll explain that. Yeah. Everything, yep, everything below the, the red, everything below the red dash line showed those strong hydric conditions of organic material. And then when you went above or up gradient closer to the house, then that red dash line, you would see those organic layers drop out. So and we, sorry. It, all right, go ahead. It, go ahead, finish. I'll I'll ask my questions later. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So what so then I mean we we then moved from this program to coming up with a concept that would encourage creation and replication. And we wanted to ensure that our replication and restoration area significantly exceeded 4,423 square feet. Just to clarify, it's, it's 14,000, so that area is 14,000. Oh yeah, sorry. There's, there's a one under. No, no, you're right, John. Yep. So, so we are we are exceeding 4,000 significantly. But we did exceed that the, the one yeah there's a little discount kind of online there. So so yeah, so we did um make sure that our restoration area exceeded the amount of area that was presumed, filled, and altered so that we can uh, produce a, a known net loss shown on this plan of, of wetlands. A significant some of that overlaps in here, significant portion of it involves coming up into this zone, removing this pad pulling this wall back, pulling the gradient back, and creating a BVW of greater size than what was presumed lost. So to Sean's point earlier, I would echo his observations. I've, I've been doing this kind of work for 30 years. I've worked on several, several thousands of sites, uh, many violation sites, and violation sites are tricky. They're, especially when the vegetation is gone, the soils are gone, and now there's infrastructure in place, finding the balancing act of how to propose something that is consistent with the uh, keeping the Wetland Protection Act and its intent with integrity and uh, balancing that with the actions on the ground and satisfying that the Conservation Commission can be confident that it exercises its duty with, uh, with diligence. So we did take a fair bit of time coming before you with this uh, with this program, and I think if we can gain the, the buy-in, I guess is a good word, of the commission to the general principles of of what we are proposing, then to Adam's point earlier, we would refine it with a more detailed kind of um, mitigation plan. So the grades, the soils, the plantings, the monitoring, the schedule, all of that, that would typically go into a, a mitigation program. And if I could add, one of the other struggles is it's it's tough to determine on, on farm projects, particularly at the edges of ponds like this, when fills took place, right? Because that's, especially when you're around a barn or you're, you know, there used to be a barn right here. Yeah, that's where a lot of manure gets spread, a lot of material gets moved. So in terms of when the fill took place, I don't think we can in a compelling way say when that happened. What we can say is that original 4,600 square feet because of the aerials, we know when that fill took place. But the fill that's shown here, I don't think we can say with certainty when it took place. So I think that's enough to probably get the discussion going.
I'm, I'm just going to throw something out there because we, we just got these comments from the DEP. Do you guys want some time? You want to come back another meeting and kind of do some research on these? Our, our preference uh, with your permission is to get feedback from the commission okay. uh, to the extent it has that feedback now. Okay. Because, I mean, ultimately, it's, I, I mean, it's, you have jurisdiction over this enforcement. I'm just matter. giving you a a caveat right now. No, no, Lana. thank you. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. You're yes. just seeing this. We're just seeing this. Yes. It's only fair to actually offer you that. Well, and, and we're confident in, in our approach and we're confident in the work that we've done. And so, I mean, we'll, we'll answer whatever the questions that come up through you because it, to, to Adam's point, this is, this is your decision. We're coming here, and as we've always done, in a cooperative way to try to come and reach an a, a equitable conclusion. And you know, we've we've got some time before the end of the year. If this is something we can get done soon, we can get it done this year. Otherwise, it's going to drag out, and who knows when it gets done. Yeah, I would add that that's a really good point that Sean makes. Is we're in the process now of doing many replication areas and similar mitigation processes. So the streams are dry, wetlands are low, groundwater is low. This is the optimal time to do this work. And so um, there is, I think, in order to, to regain compliance, there is some incentive to, to move ahead on this. I also agree with Sean that this is definitely, even though DEP has, can insert some comments, and it sounds like they have, um, all, this decision lies with the, with the commission for sure on how to move forward. And, and respectfully, yeah. um, we were ready to move on this in January. <laughs> And we weren't allowed to do a site visit until well into spring, uh, into June. So we we would have probably been to at a better point right now if if that had happened, if our site visit had happened sooner. It's, it's we're not making excuses. We're just looking forward. No, but, so. yeah, but you're pushing. So I'm just telling you, no, no, we no, were we're here. Just, we're ready. We're not. This is this is your process. We're we're, we're here providing information in the interest of resolving the issue. The, the reality is. We have some time, so it's not a threat. We're not going anywhere. The so it, just we have some time to do it. If people want to sort of you know, work towards that goal, we're we're happy to 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 comply. Um, why don't I take a real quick just to explain that what we're proposing to do to to uh, replicate? Um, do you um by chance have the first plan that you had just so we can see the difference between? what the 4,000 square feet was, or even if it's on that same map, actually, it, it, it looks familiar. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we left it off intentionally because we didn't want to confuse things. Nope, right. I see you there, just for a point of reference. The, the, the original, it was, it was, it was more radial, so it was more of a projecting up into the landscape. It was 4,600 square feet, so roughly a third of what, what this area showing us? Can you go to the other plan? Actually, before, before you do, I'm sorry. It's OK, Sean. I, I think I, I have it in my notes anyway. I just wanted to see how that kind of fit in there. But um, go ahead and, and make your point, so it's fine. So I don't want to. What I want to do is stay on this <laughs> point. Right, no, do, do that. Let's keep let's keep it going. So, so the first thing is, is recognizing that we've got a paved driveway that's real close to the edge of that in the 25 foot no disturbance on so so our first thing to do would be obviously would be to, to anything within 25 feet pulling that up so that all this area that you see in red this existing pavement that's out there right now that we get removed it's also a, a concrete pad that would get removed as well and a stone wall that's built in this area So as you can imagine, this is where we're flipped now. Just to get a little bit more zoomed in to get a little bit more sort of focus on the area that we're talking Oops, about. Oh God. <laughs> no, I mean the, the, the image zooms in the, it's, a, yeah. it's a tighter scale, so it looks a little bit different as we're taking. So now the pond is here, the house is here. This is that curve where the curved wall is. What we're proposing to do, as I mentioned, is removing that wall, removing all that pavement, removing all this pavement. And then for that 14,000 square feet or so of, of historic fill, we're proposing 
a slightly bigger area of wetland replication here, and then moving the driveway out of the 25 foot disturbed zone, and then planting a robust buffer zone edge with a series of plants and, and blueberry bushes and things like that, as well as a large tree with some shade to that as well. And then that would offset in part. So this is an area of a small area that would be um, replicated in place or restored in place. This would be a replication of just of, of recreating the same area, eating up the which was lost. That's our proposal for sort of bringing this to closure. Okay, committee members, commission members, I'm going to leave it open the floor. If anyone has anything to ask or add or. Well, I had a few things. Um, thanks for clarifying that this deal broke. Um, there's a few, few comments in the, like the report was sort of needs uh, more detail um, that I noted. Um, for example, those cross towards between um, test pits, like more and more called test pits and whatnot. Um, there's a, you know, the monthly col oh, color chart symbols are just in there and not, you know, for the typical layman. So anyone that's uh, more interested in that doesn't have the technical knowledge would have to. Um, It'd be helpful to put the colors in there as well. It was missing things such as groundwater and modeling and you know any odors, sulfuric odors and whatnot. So stuff of those stuff of that nature. Um and what else did I notice? Oh yeah. So also the um NRCS uh soils depict the site being within two different formations. One is um Loam under, over Lodgement Hill, and the other one is Ridgeberry 78, which is located on the site, listed as hydric soils. And I'm wondering if you had encountered the Lodgement Hill and the, the layer of water that usually runs over it, because we have the same condition just down the street from um, the house. So, yeah, so the material in the upland areas was a, a mixing of, of material. So it, it it doesn't it didn't follow the typical stratifications of a ridgeberry or or um, you know any of the soil profiles that you would expect to see. You didn't go through a nice clean A or B or C, which is mm -hmm. the, right, that's right. typical of ag sites. So I wouldn't I wouldn't expect to sign those the profiles that you're referring to. And I think one of the, I'm I'm just looking on my computer here at the comments from DEP. You know that was one of the things that they mentioned about. About um, you know wondering if you could if, if they were characterized upland soils and that I think that's just not maybe not understanding the the ag history here. Yeah, and the photos. Um, do you guys have better photos of the borings? Because in the report they're sort of reduced quite a bit, and it's hard to tell exactly. You know, was it like gray? And you know, then yeah. besides having to look it up, some of them are are good, but the other ones are pretty small. Could probably, you know, the the or, or, or you know, make yeah make better resolutions for you. But yeah, it definitely would be helpful to have the uh, months of color chart descriptions in the uh, the uh, descriptions. Mm -hmm. You said you have to go down multiple depths in order to get to what would be considered um, natural soil, right? It depends. I mean, it was typically around three to four feet of fill, sometimes five feet of fill, but it's kind of in that range. So when, Scott, when it got to the point where it was the mixed uh, materials, what was the elevation as opposed to the pond elevation? Um, so if the pond was at 374, right. what was the mixed materials? Where did they start or stop anyways? Yeah, I'd have to pull that out for you those numbers and but it would probably it would be above probably 374 but i'll i can get that for you i don't know that would give a better indication of you know even if you went down to where it became solid material again where it was undisturbed um then you would have a baseline of where where you could start from yeah. and you could also calculate with how much moisture was in soil whether or not it held water more than not mm -hmm. Yeah, I can probably look at those elevations a bit more for you. Um, in your findings section, basically, um, I believe it's pure speculation saying that um, you know, the fill material may have been. Wait, where is it? Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just had it. Oh gosh. Um, 
yeah, basically this film material may have been placed during historical agricultural cultural use, which is pure speculation. Um, uh, it's like, say, if you're writing, like, say, an ESA or a MCP phase one or whatever, you can't speculate. So, in this, and I believe the same is here, too. I mean, I, that should I, be stricken out. I, I have visited that property three times. Yeah, I walk by it every day for like 20 yeah, years. Yeah, and I, I've been in the back and stuff like that because she used to sell like rare herbs, of course. I'm a plant person, <laughs> so, you know, we tranced around that property quite a few times and, um, it was very wooded, very um, right up to that barn. Even where the barn was, it was very overgrown and wooded. And so um, it's a lot different today than I remember it. Uh, sure. But uh, in my gardener's eye, that's the one thing I remember is how heavily wooded and how heavily. Um, it wasn't forested, but it was, you know, it was definitely very bushy. Yeah, it was maybe very bushy and very and very wet and muddy and chickens. Yeah. <laughs> um and I still have some of her plants. They were really good. Um, but yes. Um so we do we do have aerial imagery that shows it being basically pasture all the way to the edge of the of, of the, the water. So I mean there there is clear agricultural history there all the way to where the water cone is. So we're we're just saying that. We don't we don't have any indicators otherwise, right? There is a history that this is land that gets worked periodically, whether that's recent history or whether that's history long since past. You know, to, to, figure out. to that point, are those uh, aerials in? Excuse, I'm sorry. Are those aerials in your report? No, they were provided originally as part of the basis for the 4,600 square feet we originally proposed, but we can provide okay. them again. And the only Thank point you. I was going to make is I did do some historical research on the state makers site, and there's a great deal of historic information. I believe this is all part of the Davenport farm, if I recall correctly, which is on both sides of the road. Um, and uh, there's a great deal of historic information that goes back in excess of 100 years, several hundred years of, of the historic farming in this district, um, including this property and the property across the street. So it wouldn't surprise me in more recent times that you observe different conditions that may have been there. Sure, absolutely. I just one of the one of the things that um, DEP said was that the addition of fill material within the area is allowable and considerable. This is your statement. Maintenance of agricultural land within the limits of land and under under agricultural use under the WPA. And she said that was false. So I'm just so I'm that, a little mixed up and, there. And, uh, when uh, I see and, that, uh, I'm happy to consult with Attorney North, who, whom I've known for a great deal of time, and have great respect. Um, but there's a specific case I would refer the commission to. I can provide a copy. It's the Yantilly case. It's an administrative appeals decision, 1994. Um, was decided under the pre-1993 wetlands regulations. Um, um, but the, the the issue in that case was normal. Uh, maintenance and improvement of land and agriculture use. The Yantilly farm was in Wilmington. Um, they had a series of pastures. Uh, the lower pasture um, was lower adjacent to a water body and was getting wetter. Um, the, the, Gen the Yantilly's uh, wished to, to re essentially recover that pasture. Procedurally, I believe they filed an RDA. It was a negative determination. Um, um, so uh, the intention was to fill that with roughly three to five feet of fill. Um, actually, DEP took that decision from the Conservation Commission, issued a positive determination. The Antilles then filed a notice of intent to do the filling work. They actually did do the filling work. Um, Probably it's not relevant to go through the whole procedural issue. The issue that was litigated, one of the issues that was litigated um, was whether, uh, and, and, and I should say in DEP's positive determination determined that area to be BVW and bordering land subject to flooding. Went all the way to an adjudicatory appeal. One of the issues was, was that land and agriculture use and whether the addition of three to five feet of fill in that wet area was normal maintenance uh, and improvement. Uh, there was 
unrefuted uh, testimony that it was, you know, it was uh, uh, typical of farmers in New England to farm uh, to fill these wet areas in their agricultural fields, and ultimately the utilities were permitted to keep that fill within that BVW and bordering land subject to flooding. So I'm not picking a fight with DEP. I, I don't know exactly what they're saying. It's a very helpful and analogous case because, again, we, we don't know. We don't have, per, none of us here has personal knowledge of what was done, but uh, there was compelling testimony in that case. But that was a typical agricultural uh, 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 methodology that was used for a very long time um, in Massachusetts, in New England, and actually had been applied uh, and that the Wilmington farm. So, Attorney Brodsky, was the farm still in operation when they filled that field? Um, there were, they had multiple pastures. And so there was another issue in that case as to whether or not they were subject to the exemption because of that was a, uh, uh, that was a, 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 a product as opposed to, uh, so uh, I, that was an issue in the case. I can't speak to all of the, Facts of that, right? So I think, I I think there are portions, the there are portions that were farmed. There are portions that lay fallow. Um, this had not been farmed for a period of time because of the wet conditions. They went and filled it. At the end of the day, it was determined that, in fact, that was a uh, land in agriculture use, and that the filling of that BBW bordering land subject to flooding um, was was an exempt activity as normal maintenance improvement. So I'm, I'm just going to suggest that, that there's some additional information that may be helpful for you on this one issue. Again, I, I don't really know what DEP is speaking to. I am familiar with that particular case. I'm happy to send a copy of it to uh, Attorney uh, North, a cop copy of the, the commission to, to review. So it's an, in again, it, uh, I'm not sure it's an interesting issue, but it's a, it's a point of information, at least to, for me. Point of reference. Sean, I have a question. When we were on the site, when we did the site walk, weren't we interested in getting um, one or so borings on the opposite side of that um, shed, the barn of the construction? Weren't we looking to get a couple because we were questioning whether or not there was um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, an area where water would flow uh, from the street through that area? Stormwater discharge. Uh, yeah, stormwater discharge uh, area. We talked about the, the nature of water coming off of Misco Road and draining through the property. Um, what we did is we went as far as we could to the barn, recognizing that the barn was was there and you know, those, those materials would have been disturbed. Um, and we, we got to a point where we no longer found the organics, so we didn't continue past those points. Okay. So we, we, we basically followed the organics until we stopped seeing it, then took another boring beyond it, right? Whether or not it picked up again on the other side of the barn. That, that's why I wanted the yeah. borings on the opposite side of the barn is to, to determine that. Um, and the other thing that we were looking for that I don't see yet is where the um, discharge pipes were and whatnot. You, there was a bunch of uh, four inch pipes added in, uh, throughout the property or was some some uh, drainage, old drainage pipes that may have gone to that pond. Uh, not old, no, there were no old drainage pipes, so that that was part of the issue. Misco Road had a low spot that would accumulate runoff from the road, and it would it would find across the property eventually to the pond. There was no drainage infrastructure. We added those four-inch PVC pipes in the underdrain. That's shown on the existing conditions plan. Okay, and that's the ones that go around where the stone wall is, or do they go through the property? Actually, no, it goes, so, so figure there's a low point on Misco Road mm -hmm. that the water accumulates. There are four four-inch PVC holes in the wall. Correct. To allow that water to continue in through the wall and into an underdrain. Right. That goes along the wall and then discharges at that fire. Right, end. follows the wall around and then discharges into the, into the wetlands, correct? Yeah, I guess the... the the around, I want to be clear, it follows the, it goes through one turn and then goes right to the water. It doesn't continue around that curved section of wall or anything right. like that. Just, just oh. goes to daylight right there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, that is shown on the plan. It's, it's a small pipe that's right on the inside of the wall. So it's a little hard to read. 
but it, it, it discharges right at the end of that um, that stone wall, right, right, right near the way that curved wall begins. Mm -hmm. And I think we, sh we, we, we pointed out during the site visit, there's no flow that comes out of there because it's a long, long, long infiltration trench, basically, that any water from Misco Road goes into that long infiltration trench. And before it goes out into the, the wetland, it, it has an opportunity to go into the ground first. So there's, there's no visible evidence that anything's coming out of that four inch pipe at all. But. Do you know whether that was a perforated pipe or it was yeah, a yep. solid? So no, it's a perforated, perforated pipe so set in about- It will leach out all the way yeah. through. So the hole inside of that, that, that wall that runs the perimeter has a two by two stone trench with a four inch perforated PVC pipe in it. And so any water that gets on Misco Road runs through that pipe and then goes into the ground. Yeah. yeah. I have a... Oh, just a quick question. Um, so what was the rationale of not doing any more borings around 1D um, to, tri to triangulate that area to prove that that's some um, upload material? So 1D quote, is unquote. right next to where the barn is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like maybe to the left and right or whatnot. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I felt like we had enough coverage when we were out there. We just tried to reach everywhere we could within within reason. So there wasn't a specific thought not to do it in that location. We did try yeah, to follow. We, we did try to follow the the sort of the geometry that's inferred from the aerial mapping. Uh -huh. So that that line that goes towards the barn that was going along that finger that extended out towards Misco Road. And there was a couple similar shapes to that to that mapping on mass gis and we tried to sort of project lines up into that and by that finger you're talking about on the original um aerial map that showed that there might have been something there in the past yeah so, so what we're referring to is, is mass gis has a, has a data layer that sort of um estimates where wetlands may be mm -hmm. and it has a, a shape of, of that wetland boundary, usually based on vegetation. Um, and we tried to sort of extend our analysis lines up through those those shapes to make it match that as best we could. So in that back corner where near the tennis court by the concrete pad and the, um, the uh, driveway, you didn't take any soil samples in there. Can you explain why? Yeah, there's no evidence of fill in those areas, right? Okay. And which question? She's she's referring to why we didn't advance more in the. Oh, yeah, because in in that location we had a natural transition already from wetland to upland, just at the wetland edge. So, anything in that zone wouldn't wouldn't have any fill characteristics and i don't think the mapping suggested anything up in that direction the gis layer is mapped for deep water so it didn't map bbw necessarily in that that northern area if there was bbw or a transitional zone so a lot of the soil results had organic muck layer and then transitioned to something else could indicate that the open water stopped at that point and then transitioned to BVW into upland. We could do, I mean, we could do a site walk if you want to see it, but it, I think you would probably agree in the field that that area between, you know, A1 and A8, it's a forested area. So the vegetation wasn't removed and the natural topsoil is in place. I just know I grew up playing on Misco, so yeah. I know that field gets really wet up in right. that area mm -hmm. and it was vegetated throughout the, the image in 2019 I'm looking at does have a lot of vegetation. So it, it... Are you talking about where series three is? Yeah, up in three. Anyone else have anything to add? Is there anything, Isabella, that has not discussed? I can read or summarize just the two points that DEP is making. Um, 
One was that the sorrel borings are, as conducted, are unable to define the exact limit of fill. Fill may be further south or north. The borings show filled wetlands as a natural muck, which would not typically be a transition area to the wetland border. Um, transition area from wetland to upland would be expected and is likely that the wetland border may be further. The appropriate restoration protocol would be to pull the fill back starting at down gradient edge until buried upland soils are exposed. And then the so that's I guess the first point about the soil report and then the second point is that the Conservation Commission cannot permit fill to stay in place greater than 5000 square feet. So replication is not the appropriate avenue that you have to do restoration where the fill is. And that was their other point that they made. That's yeah, something. my question. My question was, you're talking about replication and not restoration and the the enforcement order required restoration. What's your legal basis um, uh, and your factual basis for focusing on uh, replication and not restoration? We believe that the current owner was responsible for filling no more than 4,600 square feet of fill. Um, the investigations have indicated that there was additional historic fill. Um, we don't know who did that. Who did that? We don't know when it was done. It could very well have been pre wetlands protection, pre 1972, for which I don't think we have any legal responsibility to remedy. It is likely. But again, we have no personal knowledge regarding this. Our assumption, based upon uh, what the experts have seen out there is suggestive of historic agricultural activities. And with that said, uh, in, in order in good faith to try and resolve the issue, proposing to do more than that. Um, and there's a, a logical way of doing that on the site, um, which is to create new uh, BVW to the north. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll defer to, to Scott and Sean why that area was chosen. I'm assuming that the hydrology in that area is is, is appropriate to do that area. Um, so that's what our focus was. Um, we are uh, restoring uh, our intention is to restore what uh, we concede the uh, the owner is, is responsible, but we wish to do more than that and in order to try and resolve this issue with the finale. So that was our thinking. And uh, if I could add, part of the reasons for doing it over there is it was it was more removed from the activity on the site. So if, if we were to restore in 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 place, for lack of a better word, it, it would extend up into the site, into the areas where we're likely to have horses, where we're likely to have activity. This placed it in an area where it was like to, more likely to stay protected. So it seemed it's and it was adjacent. It was connected. It included a portion of the historic wetland and it was immediately adjacent to it. So for us, it was it was more of a what made what made the most sense. And Attorney North, we have not had a great deal of time to digest DEP's comments. And so I understood that that's I want to explain our, our thinking uh, with respect to that. Uh, again, uh, we made a conscious decision of coming forward and working with the commission. We didn't, uh, we didn't appeal the enforcement order, and um, uh, I think we've done everything uh, that we're required to do under the enforcement order um, by stopping work, uh, doing the investigation, proposing a restoration plan. Um, obviously, we can't perform the restoration work by the deadline in the EO and we, we need to address uh, address that issue. I think what we're arguing now is is the scope of the restoration plan. Are we now restoring yeah, it to go, go ahead. And uh, sorry, I and acknowledge that that you have done a lot of work and are cooperating and you did not appeal the enforcement order and that is all appreciated. Um, 
and and also we all need to uh, and I need to take a look at um, some of the the legal issues here um, relating to agriculture. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, setting aside the agricultural issues, the enforcement order requires restoration, and your client owns property with illegal fill um, that needs to be addressed. And I understand you're addressing it. We just need to come to an agreement on the scope uh, and the focus of how it's going to be addressed. And I'm not sure that we're there yet, but um, I'll defer to the commission. Be great entirely, Attorney North. I have just one point or one speculation, I guess, on claiming the 4,600 was the client and not the rest of it. Um, and I'll just point to uh, test pit or boring hole 4B. It was found with buried vegetation as well. So I'm curious, Scott, maybe at what point would buried vegetation decompose like that? There's clearly grass in the soil boring. And I do think you might need to overlay it with that 4,600 line, but I think that boring hole is outside of that hay bale line that we were looking at before. Um, so that would be a speculation that maybe the fill was before that hay bale line and then continued further. Yeah. I mean, that's a reasonable observation. Yeah. I think what it comes down to is we just need more information. That's one soil. Uh, I don't want to say boring because I think that DEP is suggesting something else. I don't have the what, do you understand what DEP is asking for? And yeah, let me just read it one more quick question. Read it one more quick time. I can't attest to that, so I just. Right. She and, mentioned again, borings. We haven't been in touch with DEP. We don't know what they were told with respect to the site. We don't know what DEP knows yeah, with she's... respect to the historic oh, activities. I, so, I, I've reached out to DEP just with technical assistance, hmm. so they help draft me draft the EO in the beginning. So they have the background information I've provided you and you provided me. And then um, I sent them the submittals that you got just to get their comments there. But they're they're only providing technical assistance. No, no, thank you. And at some point we'd love to know with whom you're interacting with at EP. So it's a small community. We all know one another. And I'd like one point of clarification because you know part of this might be my fault, right? Because you know, to, to our conversation earlier, I, I, I mix up restoration, mitigation, replication, so, sort of in the same, same general concept. So, so there's nothing in the Wetlands Protection Act that says we have to restore the wetland. The, the only thing that makes us restore the wetland is the, is the choice of phraseology used in the EO, in that you use the term restore. Um, we've had conversations since day one that always contemplated, and we even talked about it at public hearings, talked about replicating in other areas that weren't the actual area that we that the impact was perceived to be even going back to the 4600 square feet so to the extent that that is a self-imposed criteria the restoration versus replication I'd, I'd like to know that because everything we've had discussing the matter to date always contemplated you know a replication somewhere else not just restoration exactly i know we had conversations about it but we had we were clearly intending on doing that from day one so I think I'm, the difference is that can we I address past. that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Isabella. Sorry. I was I was gonna say the difference is you were talking about forty six hundred square feet before, um, and now you're talking about fourteen thousand square feet. And as Isabella, I'm sure, was going to say, under the performance standards, the CONCOM can only allow five thousand square feet of fill to remain in place. So you've got 9,000 square feet of fill that has to be addressed in a different way. And again, I understand right. that this is new to everybody and perhaps we need to have a further discussion at a subsequent meeting. Yeah. John, one other question I have is uh, the first I've heard of, of additional replication. From what I was to understand, you guys were only proposing a one to one replication. Initially, initially we were proposing a one and a half, one point six to one, or something on that. When we were at forty six hundred, yeah. Now we're at a one to one. Yes, and and the 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 only confusion was when Scott missed the one in front of the four. So, 
we're at about we're showing 14,000 square feet of 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 historic impact, 14,000 square feet of replication. I mean, there's like literally four square feet bigger, right? But it, it's the same number. The idea we're saying is that we're 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 taking responsibility for all of what we've determined to be the historic fill line. In 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 exchange, we're just looking to match it with the replication. Right. So there is no additional. It's it's one to one. Yeah. At, at current, I mean, this is this is a discussion and a negotiation, right? Yeah. We Adam's been through this a lot. I've been through this a lot. In you know, eventually, this is going to come down to two parties agreeing on what's the best course of action. In, in, We'd like to get there as quick as possible. And you know, if, if you'd like to see more, we're we'll see what we can do, but but we'd like to resolve it so we can we can fix what's out there rather than sort of just languish and sort of going back and forth. Okay. But you know, that's our goal is to is to is is to reach an equitable conclusion where we go out there, create some some cool open space and create some some really good wetlands to replace what, what had been lost. Does the commission feel like if they did a few more borings in a few just in a few key locations that that might answer some of those questions or give us more information? I, I really would like to see on the opposite side of the barn and maybe a few up where, you know, one through six is. Yeah, that, that's that's easy to do. I know. Yeah. And we, that's we, why we can, it's a simple way to, to answer speculations. We do recognize you, that we're you're in. coming here to work with us, and we, we appreciate that. We just want to feel comfortable, um, and and make sure that you know whatever decision we come to, we can sleep at night and feel comfortable. Um, with, with if, what I would love is that if we can get you that information, and then rather than us keep sort of putting stuff in front of you, if you come back and say, well, you know, based on what we see, this is what we're comfortable with. And then see if we can see if we can meet that standard because I, I'm I'm pretty confident that we we can get there. Um, we we just need to know where where we need to get, and we're trying to give a sort of a robust solution. And but you know if we go if we have to give more, that, that's something. You know, this is what we're willing to do now today. If you said yes, this would be underway as soon as we we could get machines out there. Um, so you know, but if if you want more more information or more replication or more restoration just let us know but we'd like to be working towards a target as opposed to just sort of why don't we think of stuff i think that's what we're all doing right yeah. now working towards that target we're, look, we're looking forward to getting you on your way good with the proper information to get you there yeah. and we still have another step which is once we agree on the numbers and the in the approach we got to come back with a plan <laughs> that's pretty that, that's more specific and yes and, Yes, and, you know, has all the, the, the fine details. That's where Scott so, comes in and he'll have a plan. For Bob, it. if you wanted more soil, where would your spot be for more soil? Course? Like I said, I mean, it wouldn't be bad to have them on the other side of the, the barn under construction. I wouldn't mind having one more closer where series four is just one more above series four. What, what, can, we, can we put the plan back up? Can I can I point? I'll just show you where. Just for my I just keep in mind once you mobilize a piece of equipment, it's it's pretty easy for us to do these, so don't feel constrained by the numbers. Yeah, um, we get a good scope of what we should be. And we have access to, to the areas. We don't want to go traipsing through wetlands to get there. No, no, no. Uh, I would feel so four was about this way here. Uh, the map where the uh look around the Okay. Maybe right here. Okay. I think what Bob was saying was maybe it's right where it's Route 85 Realty. Yeah. Somewhere in that area, so two or three of them. Across the, I think we can get one just on the other side of the corner and can't keep carrying keep carrying this line on. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so I think the concern. So we did look at that spot, and there is a tremendous amount of underground electric gas. Utilities coming from that pool over over to this feature. Mm -hmm. So not, so not in this area. But we, even at that, though, Scott, sure. you you should be able to get um like dig safe in there. You're supposed to have dig safe there anyways, and they'll mock all of that stuff out. These are this is private. They don't always they don't carry everything that's private. Don't they have private um companies that'll do that? Uh, Target one, I believe, does it. We we, we can we can take a look. We'll take we'll take we'll take a look. 
Sweet. Just for just for giggles to make sure because our soil or borings weren't there. They won't be but if yeah. we have one more there. That's not for showing historical right. exactly. and then, and then we also we're also talking about when one hand side or I was not uh, spoken to as far as natural grade and and um, undisturbed land. Yeah, as long as you're comfortable with that, I mean, we're pretty confident that there's no evidence that this edge has been disturbed. But on additional data, certainly. Happens. Are you able to do on this side of the tennis court just one and cup or two? Get a two D in there, I guess. So along with same three. Yeah, three. Maybe just D's and E's. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting up into the more of the built environment, so we're going to have to sort of use some discretion to try and find places that are less likely. To be next, but. Okay. I think that would help us because, you know. And you're right. Uh, once the machine's there, putting it to use for eight hours a day or, or three hours a day, you pay for the day. Um, we have a, we have a question from Mia Butter. Would you announce yourself? Not to be unruly about it. Picking up that. Carl Hummel, uh, fifteen Misco Road. I'm wearing my Butter hat. Uh, so, given that I'm not speaking on the commission at this point, I can be a bit more selfish than I might be otherwise. My interest as someone who lives across the lake and hears all the construction noise when there are no leaves in the trees is it'd be really great if you could do stuff in the next month before they all fall off. And again, I agree the water level, it's mostly mud at this point because we had no rain for a couple of weeks. So I agree that it would be very nice if you were able to go and do that. My question for the commission is, as you're asking to have more samples is, how is that going to impact the decision that you would be making? When Kevin Meehan bought the property, he had an expectation that he'd be able to use his backyard for stuff. And I agree, all three of us, you went there and observed it being Woody, Susan walked by it. I was able to walk up and down the street and the backyard was not a swamp. It was, you know, dirt, whatnot. So when Mr. Meehan bought the property. He had an expectation he'd be able to do stuff. Now, at some point, somebody went in there, and we're not going to speculate who, and they did fill in 44,000 4, some odd feet that they shouldn't have, that they should have come to the commission for and said, no, you're within 25 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet. The question is, before that happened, when they set up the line of hay bales farther up, and demonstrated that they were out the hay bales were outside the 100 foot buffer from the extend the existing one kevin had an expectation that he'd be able to use the lawn up there so my question for the commission is now they're coming back and saying okay we're admitting they want to do replication restoration mitigation of 14,000 square feet if they come back and do more core samples how much more would you ask for him to not have in his backyard anymore or do you think that 14,000 square feet is enough and their plan to remove some of the stuff up on the northern part near where the school is and turning that back into swamp, is that enough of a mitigation? My concern is that you don't want to have the owner feel like you're trying to take his lawn away, that you're trying to, to, to remove his ability to use the property in the way that he expected he would be able to use it when he bought the property because a previous owner went in and did things. And again, the, the, the Davenport farm was active in the 40s, 50s, 60s. So there's no way of knowing how far back somebody went in and it may have been before 1972. And I'd like to have the property finished so Mr. Meehan can use it and then it's not vacant at the end of the street. So as again, as I was saying, this is my selfish perspective. I would hope that you could, you know, come to some kind of conclusion. And if you really need core samples, ask yourself, how will the core sample information change your opinion of what you would want having done on the site? So that's that's my two cents on this.
Can I speak to that? Sure. The reason why I'm looking for core samples is just to see where we should be starting. What what the scope of the endeavor is is looking to start at. That's the only reason why. Um, to del fully delineate. Correct. So that's the only reason why I'm asking for ones in different locations because until we know where it starts, <coughs> we don't know where yeah. to start. Well, I think to Sean's point earlier too, uh, Bob, we did we did stop the boring. So if you look at all of those lines on each spoke, the lines extend beyond where the prominent organic material dropped out. So there was no organic material at all, or it was just at a higher or lower level. So if you look at the probes, there was the, there were thick O layers, organic layers, yeah. directly underlaying the fill. All of those boring locations are captured within the red. That's, okay. that's what dictated that red dash line. Right. So anything that that may be an organic layer organic. that doesn't have fill on it. Your organic, is, no, no. Or, organic as in a thick layer of decomposing leaves or material. Like versus, swamp material. Yeah, not organic as in virgin. Right. No, I understand that. And so once the probes had a soil composition change, it coincided with getting further and further up the hill in each of these cases. So if you look at down here, we have Thick organic, thick organic, thick organic, mm -hmm. then the thick organic drops out. So then the line is drawn in between those points. Thick organic, thick organic drops out, line goes between the points. And by the time you get here, we're right up against the yeah, the pool area. Right. Once we were here, we were right up against the building. Thick organic, thick organic, thick organic drops out from this point. Then by the time you get there again, we're now pushing up slope quite a bit. Got a utility building there. Same here, the thick organic, thick organic drops out, go over here, tennis court. So if there's already a drop out here, you do another hole over here. I'm not expecting it to just reappear because we're that much further up, slope up gradient. And likewise. But things have been disturbed there anyway, because you put a tennis court. Yeah, no question. No question about it. So well, that makes sense then. No, but it does make sense That's that if, I was asking the question. if you did a boring beyond where you had disturbed, that would still answer give us information. The, yeah, I mean once you get once you get the I mean it's disturbed, I guess, up to the property line. And once you get up in the air, we were way up in elevation 473 up on this window or into this neighbor's backyard. So it's very clearly upland condition backyard. And once you get to this, there's a shrub line over here. There's no indication off site that direction. There's a wetland. And actually, in that area, that tennis court is constructed in a cut. So there's a there's a retaining wall. I don't know if you remember, but there you come from the baseball field across the fence. There's a there's a small retaining wall. There's a two foot of cut in that area. So that I, right here. yeah, there's a retaining wall right there that steps down where 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 the the, the grade was. Cut to establish the grade for the tennis court. Yeah. So that's why I was asking. There's a hill over here. Then if you go this way, once you get to the other side of this barn, you're at Misco, and then beyond Misco, there's no wetlands on the other side of the street right there. That's just that we were coming across. Well, the reason why I was asking about the elevations is it looks like you're hugging the, you know, the it looks like what C line as opposed to D line. It's it's more. Um, it's more favorable to C than D. It's not a mm -hmm. middle line. Wasn't that based on the, like the thickness too of the layers that you were seeing and how we sort of interact? Right, which speaks to elevation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, we had to draw the line somewhere. Right. So no, I, I understand. So at, yeah, right. At, at some point, we just we're kind of, there's a little bit of guesswork involved in this for sure. Short of digging a trench. Sort of and, and frankly, if it if it if it if it was a tenable scenario forward, if we wanted to say 
let, let's just say it's 17,500 square feet and we'll mitigate or replicate for that. You know, if we, if you want to have that conversation, we can, we can drive this to closure that way rather than sort of try to poke at the edges and try to sort of figure out exactly what it is. To me, it's a much more effective use of my time and Scott's time. If, if we just say, okay, well, given the anxiety that we have, it, we can, we can satisfy that anxiety by increasing the, the, the replication area by 20%. And then that would capture any of that concern. I think we could come back with a solution. Yeah. It's probably going to hurt a little bit. Um, we'll probably lose some of the tennis court, but we're motivated to get this done. If we can make that decision now, then, then we're now doing productive work instead of that you know, not so much productive work. That does make more sense. Right. So if, if we're at 14,423 right now and we just said, OK, let's just say it's 20 percent more. Again, setting the legal stuff aside, whether we can or cannot do it. I'd like to have marching orders coming out of here. If if we could say we'll do 17,000 square feet of, of replication instead of 14,400. In, in a manner, as we currently propose, would the commission accept that provided that the attorneys can make sure it's within your realm of authorization? Now, I, I, I would. Is that in our realm of authorization, though, Isabella? I think you would need to do just a few more borings of the ones we went over, kind of to confirm how far out, because again, we get back to the issue of fill left in place is not permittable by the commission. So you need I, more I, I, I see a path forward, and we'll, we're going to talk about that issue. Again, I've had another three hours to think about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll we will address that issue. We understand that that's a concern of the annoying about her. Do you have a question? Hey, that's not respectful. <laughs> so you know what? I lost my turn. This is for. Yeah, I I think. Um, Isabella, we're going to have to have a attorney Brodsky will do some work and some thought and and um, we'll have some additional conversations about uh, what makes sense from a legal perspective here and what can be done and what can't be done. So that sounds like delay two weeks while the attorneys put their heads together and come up and solve the problem. Second issue is, do you feel the need to have more samples, and could they get done? Zones back in two weeks. That what the commission feels that they still need that to do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's so busy right now, so it's like I, I'd have to check. We'll do everything we can, you know, but it's it's going to be. We, we're going to have to have time to process it, and before we put it in front of you, we, we got to make sure we've got an informed opinion as to what, what they mean. And I'm not confident that more core samples are going to provide more. What's that again? You heard my input. On well, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm not confident that they're going to produce more useful results than what we had. You know, there's worst case we find some more historic filled wetlands that someone else filled for which to me it's not responsible. I mean, that, I'm trying to distill it down. <laughs> In down. your opinion, he's not responsible, Attorney Brodsky. Um, that, that's correct. Right. No, not subject to any enforcement order when he purchased the property, and uh, more likely than not, maybe pre Wetlands Protection Act. So, and I'm going to throw out a, just a suggestion. I can be vetoed on it in a moment. In the interest of time and trying to wrap this up, would it be would it be beneficial to ask for a three minute recess so that we could just talk, sure. talk briefly sure. in the hall? You have to ask sure. the chair. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I don't know if there's a quiet place in this building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good timing. Start in the areas that they know. I didn't need to run something. Attorney Karras? Yes. Do you have a suggestion on whether or not we continue this until two weeks from now or? 
Um, what are your thoughts? Yes. I think that um, I know that I need some time to give you some now that I have a clearer understanding of the issues and it was very helpful to be here tonight and to hear all of the discussion. I need to be able to give you some solid legal advice about what your options are to move forward. And uh, I'm going to need a little bit of time because I'm on trial next week. So I'm not going to be able to really delve into this until the week of the 23rd. Um, and your next meeting would be on the 26th. 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 Oh. <sighs> so my question is at this point, would it be your recommendation when the when the applicants come back from recess that we suggest um, a continuance until you have time to um, mull over all the information and then convene after that? Yes. Um, you want and, two or four weeks then? Um, I hate there to make you go out four weeks and let me just look at my calendar too. Um, you meet on Thursdays Correct. and in so the 26th and then the 10th, I don't, I really don't want you to go as long as the 10th. And then after that, I'm in town meetings on Thursday nights for probably into early November. So why don't we try to, um, why don't we schedule a next meeting for, let me just, oh, I have a conflict. Uh, anyway, on the 26th, I have a ZBA meeting in another community I have to be at. I don't, so, uh, I, and I, I can't, I have to be there for that. Um, would, you, would you be able to send us some comments if you can't attend? Absolutely. Yep, I can send you some comments and, um, you know, maybe, um, maybe there's an opportunity for a short, I don't know if we're really, maybe there's an opportunity for a short meeting um, with just myself and the council and the commission at some point. Um, I'm taking my hat off. That. I'm taking my hat off and speaking as chair. If necessary, we will schedule an off cycle meeting. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I will absolutely send you comments. Um, I would like to have the benefit of. I mean, I, yes, so uh, we'll figure that out. Um, so you, you're you thinking maybe have some conversation with the, uh, with the council yep. and, and yeah, okay, that makes yep. sense. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I need to do, I need to read a couple of things, including the case that he referenced, um, but some other things as well. So. And then from what I'm on. From what I'm hearing is if we need an October 3rd meeting, that may be possible. Yep, it's Rosh Hashanah. I don't know if that makes a difference for other people, um, but 10-3 uh, is also possible. I would hate to go much beyond that. Um, so yeah, let's, I, I recommend you uh, continue to the 26th. Um, I'll get you some thoughts before then um and we'll go from there and, and maybe you can have conversation with the with the other council yeah that'd be great that'd be great yep adam and i know each other well okay. we've been working together for yeah forever good i think that would be really helpful i think that works out good for everybody because if we uh have a clear path forward then everybody wins yep yep okay now they're just gonna um, come So. Okay. All right, that three minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> Harris, if they ask to go to October 10th, you're not available then either? Um, let me double, no, I am available. I'm pretty sure I'm available on the 10th. Let me just double check. I thought you said you had a ZBA meeting. No, so I have a ZBA meeting on the 26th. Okay. ZBA meeting on the 26th. I'm available the 3rd and the 10th.
and then after the 10th, I will be unavailable for probably the next three Thursdays. Is there someone I else have... from the is there someone else from the firm who will be able to or are all of you on town meetings? <laughs> no, well, not nobody else has the 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 joy of the town meeting that I get that goes six to ten nights. Um, so we'll if, if yeah. I we'll figure it out. Let's and you're you're already on now. you're already on board with this. I think that makes sense to uh, yeah definitely stay okay, on. Let's, it doesn't um, have to be Thursday. Yep. No, we'll, we'll, let's, so I cannot be there on the, tw on September 26th, but I will try to get a legal, a, a written legal opinion to you. And if for some reason I can't, I will let you know. Thank you. that keeps everything moving so it's good yeah i want to keep you moving forward i think it's important for for abutters who don't want to you know be disturbed by loud equipment well i'll yeah. just point out that they can't do replication in the dead of winter they can't plant trees in the dead of winter no. so it would be pushed to next spring not yeah. winter you know, um, I would like to say on the additional borings, Bob, that you're re referring to, you know, we did a site walk out there and um, they did explain how they were going to graduate up gradient and um, determine, you know, where they would work out of whatever fill was placed. But I would say that, you know, on some of that area, you could almost drill anywhere and find some hydric soils down there because it's been a such a long historic farm that's that's my opinion on that anyway and right and that's i'm i'm not expecting there to be anything out of the ordinary yeah i'm just saying i'm just saying yeah. you could drill anywhere and find something that's all <clears throat> ms whiting could i be heard please absolutely go for it so i i i think i understand uh with the assistance of attorney north a deep concern um, so we have we have admitted uh, that the, the client has billed approximately 4,600 square feet of wetlands. But in our design, we're not proposing to remove all of that fill that we claim that we're responsible for. That wouldn't be a 100% restoration of the, of the work that uh, we're responsible for. So at a minimum, this plan has to show us removing the 4,600 square feet of fill where it's located in kind and restoring that area to BVW. So we have a 100% restoration of, of what we acknowledge um, was filled by our client. With respect to the historic fill, I, I think I'm concerned and I was perhaps a little bit too candid that we'll be sort of chasing our tails on that. Um, and, uh, you know, given the limited information I have, I think we have a good argument that, that the client may not be responsible for that historic filling. Regardless, we're willing to provide, and that would be really mitigation, right? So mitigation for the historic filling, which would then include additional creation of wetlands on the site. So that we have 100% restoration of, of what we acknowledge the client did out there, and we have mitigation for what we believe is historic filling by the creation of additional wetlands out there. So, you know, in total, you're going to have 14,000 or approximately 14,000 uh, feet, or whatever you choose is appropriate, mm -hmm. of, of, of new wetlands. 4,600 square feet restored, so 100% restoration of what we acknowledge is done, plus as mitigation. And an additional ten thousand or whatever that that number is of of new wetland to again we're not replicating it's really mitigation for historic activities on that site so um, that's an idea uh, we haven't spoken to the client um, but I, I think that's how we thread I think that's how how we can thread the regulatory needle I obviously need to speak with the attorney North 
Um, it, it, but that that's a, a, an approach we're, 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 we're thinking, I think that would address um, the, the problem we have of, of having residual fill remain in place that we admit we're responsible for. So is it my understanding that the red dotted line would be 100% removed? No, no, sir. So we have to show on this plan the original 4,600 square feet of area that we, we admit. Oh, that's 14,000. Yes, sir. <laughs> so that okay. we got to put that on the plan. We got to pull all of that material out and we got to give you a, a complete wetland restoration of that area. Right. Um, then the difference between that area and the line area, the 14,000, right. that, that approximately well, 10,000. You would prefer to move somewhere else. We prefer to move somewhere else because we're not conceding that we're responsible for it, but we're mitigating for that historic alteration that occurred. I think I don't think there's any dispute, given the observations that the commission made, that that was before Mr. Meehan bought the property. And again, I can I can perhaps argue with Attorney North as to who's responsible for that that historic fill. Um, you know, we're not aware of any any prior enforcement action concerning it, so no one was ever on notice. But at least as a concept, I think that threads the regulatory needle um, going forward. And if, if that's something the commission is interested in pursuing, um, we can certainly run with that. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, sir. That we continue this until at least the 26th, let you and, and um, council speak, come up with um, comments and uh, present them at the 26th meeting and Therefore, then we'll have more understanding of the legal side of this. Happy to do, obviously, whatever the commission wishes us to do under the circumstances. I think it. I, I think that's that could be a doable plan. I don't know. Again, I don't. I can't speak to any of the legalities or um, our our laws, our WPA laws. I think that's going to have to be. No. That's why I'm suggesting. Yeah. I mean, yes, I, I, I'm going to make a motion that we continue until. Um, September don't need 26th. Because it's not a hearing. <laughs> then I'm going to make a suggestion. Did, that did you reach resolution on the need for the additional investigation work? I think if if the if the fourteen thousand feet came out a little bit more, it would probably help because then we could at least account for that. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's the DEP in mind. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that might be the solution there. Right. Does uh, the board agree with that? Uh, Tim, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, um, if, if, if that's what the board, um, I, I think that's an equitable, you know, um, you know, um, solution. But, you know, I think if we're gonna come up with a footage, I think we should come up with the footage and then let uh, a attorney North and their attorney work, you know, have some conversation and um, maybe the next meeting. I know uh, attorney North can't make the 26th, so maybe on the 3rd, we can come up with a solution and, and maybe get this thing going before the winter hits so they can so they can correct and and do what they have to do while it's dry. You know, if, if that's what the board is thinking, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, Bobby, you OK with that? We have a question in the audience. Oh, okay. Yeah. My question is in terms of the public here. Will there be the risk to be a butter of any proposed solution when we actually send the equipment in? No public hearing is required under an enforcement order. Okay. Correct. The, the expectation is that once we finish with the the work, we, we will have a new wetland line that we'll have to delineate. And then any other work beyond that would be subject to. You know, we're we're not going to touch anything without coming back to you for for a notice of intent. And, and there, there's work that remains to be done. So what we'll do is we'll, if we agree to the terms of the enforcement fix, we'll do that work, delineate that boundary, reestablish buffer zones to that new boundary, and then any any time we're doing work, we'll. Will come in and get a notice of intent for that, and then it would that notice of intent would show the the fixed condition as our starting point, as opposed to some sort of nebulous mix of a bunch of different contingencies. So, are we going to agree to a um, square footage tonight? I'd love it if we did. Um, 
So if we've got 4,600 for the original, original proposed um, fill, we were at 14,000 now. If we did 4,600 plus another sort of instead of 10,000, 12,000 square feet. So for That's a total, it's 16,600 square feet. I mean, I, I would be OK with that. It's just it's all going to depend on legalities. Right. I can't yeah. for sure say that that can't move, that that could be a, something to aim for. Let's try to address that by the October 26th meeting. September, September 26th meeting. Yeah, September 26th meeting. Sorry. OK. Yeah. And again, that that that's forty six hundred would be restoration in place in, in the exact area of impact. The other will likely be some part in the historic area that we've identified, but a significant portion outside of it. Right. But it's high in so that it blends in yep. and makes a nice looking border edge. And what we can do is we can give you a, a, a an accounting of of how that breaks out. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we're on a, a yeah. path to succession. Yeah. Hopefully you guys can work it out in the uh, off meeting. So. Everyone, anyone else last chance to forever hold your peace or, or at least until two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Isabella, any comments? Nope. OK. Attorney, no. attorney North, you're good for now. I'm good for now. OK, Tim, you're good. Bob, you're good. Susan's good. good for now. Yeah, I'm good. OK. Let's do it. Thank you guys. We appreciate Thank you. It. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. <laughs> safe drive. Uh, safe, uh, safe drive back to Can the you want to just continue that? that. <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Norm. Less involved in this. I want to pass this one back. Oh, Karis, sure. good night, all. Wait, Karis, do you want to stay out? Oh, damn it. <laughs> she, <doesn't know>. she left. <laughs> she wanted out. Oh, I don't think I don't I don't think we need her because we're still gathering information about this next one. OK, so I have been I'm taking my my butter hat off. I'm uh, resuming the writer or something. Uh, Kyle, put that hat on. Annoying a butter. <laughs> so in, 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 we will now move on to agenda item number eight, 134. I'd normally have Susan go off in the audience, but given your mobility or your case. You yeah, I just won't say anything. <laughs> well, you can you can put a hat on. You can borrow my butt for that. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, enforcement order issued April 24th. Review and dis uh, nope, that's the wrong one. 133 North. Uh, review and discuss activity that may be in violation of the WPA and Menden Tech Wetland Protection Bylaw. So. Um, Away. Thank you, Chair Holland. Good evening again. My name is Adam Brodsky. I'm an environmental attorney representing Route 85 Realty Corp. Again, so the record is complete. I'm here with Sean Rudin, our professional engineer from Tetra Tech, as well as Scott Goddard, our professional wetland scientist from Goddard Consulting. And very briefly, since we last spoke with you regarding this matter, um, we were able to get an existing conditions planned, surveyed, in place, which we need as our baseline for doing the historic research related to this. And uh, this is an active agricultural use, and again, part of the historic agricultural farm activities for decades. So we're, we're, now that we understand the, the boundaries of the property, um, we need a, additional time to go through and do essentially what we were able to do with this site which is to review all of the historical information. Um, I uh, want to delineate in this case uh, the limits of land agricultural use, and then we can have a conversation regarding the activities within those boundaries. So unless there's additional information, um, we'd ask that this matter also be continued so we can continue that work, please. Could, could you say again what has already taken place is some kind of surveying yes yes so we didn't have survey control over this property we now have survey control so we have a surveyed existing conditions plan what what does survey control mean is that chart so on 134 we had a, a project and so there was a, a working boundary under understanding of what the project boundary was where our property limits were 
what the topography was, where the wetlands were. In this case, we 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 have we we started from scratch. Okay. So so our first order of business was okay. Get a reliable topographic plan of the entire parcel, so we understand where our property boundaries lie in the the relative elevations of everything out there. I mean, as you as you know, that that's a pretty steep sloping yep. site. So any delineation or discussion of wetlands along a slope is you know, we got to understand all the topography explicitly. So we had a, a professional surveyor go out there and do a complete property survey and a complete topographic survey. We just got that back last week. It, it, it takes weeks, if not months, to get surveyors to complete this work. So yep. I mean, it was ordered immediately and okay. we just got it. And, and so what do you expect the next step to be? Before you're able to come back with a, a packet for for us to review. I mean, I've been to the site. I've looked at the site. Um, we haven't done an existing conditions wetland delineation out there, so that might be a next uh, step. Maybe photographic documentation of current conditions, comparing those to some historical aerials, trying to quantify for you guys what all has taken place out there with maybe a timeline and areas to help start wrapping our heads around the current activities and how they relate to past agricultural activities. Uh, so is that something you expect to come back with in two weeks or four weeks or six? Probably four weeks would be better if we could, yeah. Yeah. If we could leapfrog the two parcels. Probably a good idea. We devote the next hearing to 134 and then 133. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think we're going to have sufficient time in two weeks to gather up all of the information again i've already begun to do the historic agricultural history and, and again there's a lot more direct information running that side of the street because that's where the barn was and the, they were actively yeah more, well, more recently actively farming that's right my, my i i did a lot of research on the davenport farm before i bought my parcel and yes the the, the area on my side of misco avenue going up misco hill was basically mostly fallow pasture, um, passive kind of, whereas on the other side is where they were doing the active planting. Um, at what point do you think you would be able, would be comfortable having us do a site walk? And you, you said you had an existing survey plan for us to, to, to look at that. Yeah, I think I think any time this, this um, fall is a good time to do it, you know, and within the next few weeks. You know, okay. prior to, prior to the next meeting, I think I think it makes a lot of sense. So, anytime within the next say three to four weeks, you guys want to do it. Um, is the field hay? Is it tall grass it's or it's blueberries? Oh, it's blueberries. <laughs> All blueberry bushes. Oh, <laughs> no, I haven't been on the site yet. Mm -hmm. So, so it sounds like um, the the week before our October meeting is October something. Yeah. So it sounds like. Wednesday, October 9th, Thursday, October 10th would be a good time to schedule a site walk. That makes sense. Sure. And it would be helpful if you could present us whatever documentation you have in terms of your existing plot plan. And, uh, and, and that way we have something to look at as we're, we're going around. Yeah, you will show us here's where you think the historic buildings are. Here's where the the stone wall is or was or was not and abutting the properties and whatnot. I think that makes perfect sense. Do we want to land the plane on that date and time now or just do we want to convey on that as it gets closer? I, I would suggest um, we're coming into the rainy season. We might want to pick up day. Well we, we could do we could do Wednesday the ninth at ten and just say that and then if schedules change we can it. pull it in if it looks like it's a Hurricane coming or fit to Thursday. Okay. Yeah, and hopefully uh, the the other question is if you would be welcome to have Susan as an abutter as opposed to a commissioner attending that site walk. Um, you're looking at me. I'm not sure I'm the right person right. to look well, at I, that the, question. The, three, the same way you extended me the courtesy of looking at one thirty four. If she, can, I, I can't foresee any objection to that. Okay. So Whether she can take it or not, we're, we might have to make special accommodations. <laughs> There's no blueberries left, so oh. that'll give you a chance to get a bit more. That's a bummer. Going down, going down so, so, so is this, um, what's the date? We're tentatively scheduling it for October 9th, Wednesday, October 9th at 10 a.m. And can, can we do, could we do nine? Would nine work for everybody? 
depends on the I'm people kidding. with the I'm not the, <laughs> I'm not the crack of dawn at this matter. I'm a minor. We, 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 we will check the weather forecast that weekend and we may adjust it if necessary. I might be no, so oh, 9 a.m. Uh, any objections to 9 a.m.? No. Okay. Cool. Be on the All right. And since this is this is just a review, we don't need a motion to, to pick a date. I will point out one just point of observation for that site is we do have so we have Muddy Brook that runs along the back there, and it is dry right now. Very. And and we're not. It's it's mapped as a perennial stream. Um, we are documenting it just for that purpose, but if the commission wanted a chance to see it dry, I could take a walk with Isabella out there now so that you've been able to put eyes on it. Uh, I think that could be a useful exercise because we're going to have the photos and stuff and have that discussion, I'm sure, at some point, but it's useful in that window of opportunity yeah. before the rainy season starts but up again. The swamp 134 is I've got mud there instead of standing water. It's the there's a there's a pool going over between our two parcels, but going down towards the school, it's it's mud at this point because the the water levels. All our rivers are dry here right now. <laughs> um, it's not, it's so yeah, I think. Drought, I think western. Some some, some areas that have some drought conditions. Yep. Not in here. Lots of perennial. Yeah, if it was so high, so is the big reservoir. Let me, if you want to see that, just let me know. We can take it. Okay. You can let uh, Mary here. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll make it work. You can just email. Okay. Me uh, so I think that concludes uh, discussion. Thank you very much. much. Thank you guys for the time. Forward to seeing you as in a butter in two weeks and getting other people on that part of the trip. Thanks, guys. Thank Have you. a good one. Thank you. Bye. -bye. All right, uh, let's zoom so we can finish by 10. Uh, agenda item 10, 23 Cape Road, DEP 218-0838. Uh, review the site visit report from August 28th after a complaint from the butter with silt in water. So Isabella. Have you all seen my site visit report or do you want me to pull it up? Can you pull it up? Yeah, I did see it. That was where going in the water. Wait, chair? that I got the neighbors' pictures. I guess I'll just show all of it. Um. So I got a. Complaint from an abutter um, two or three weeks ago, and they documented um, the Mill These River. The pictures that looked really bad, right? Yeah. Brown, muddy water. Yep. The Mill River running pretty muddy. Um, what street? This is 23 Cape Road. Let's Cape. see. It's it's the warehouse project. The abutter was uh, Talbot Street. Yeah, in Gasco. It's happened before too. It has happened before. I went to first. I walked away. Um, yeah, so Gas Gasco sold the property, right? It's not Gasco anymore. It's owned by Blue Water. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Lighting boards. Looking at another warehouse at Twenty Three Cape Road. Now. Oh, that's mm -hmm. right. right next to it. Right. Further, just the parcel up closer to the road. Right. You don't look at the planning board agendas. They come out. No, we're not leaving. Uh, Sometimes I do. You might have a small ski slope on it, but yeah. <laughs> so here, these are the photos I received by the abutter, and it is follow the yellow brick road. <laughs> definitely silty. Wow. Um, but there has been several times in the past few years when the river has looked like this. Um. I think the question is where is it coming from? Yeah, exactly. that's, what, that's what Isabella site walk. I have a theory. Right. I have a couple theories as well. Um, so two things. One, that Monday, Hopedale broke a beaver dam by the airport. And so that could have released silt. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking happened is um they were doing the hydrant flushing uh to they were 
they released all of the water in the hydrant, pumped it down to this culvert here, and I'm wondering if these culverts were not empty of sediment before they did that, so it wasn't necessarily that the silt came off the site or that silt. There was no exposure of a lot of silt. No break in silt fence, and then I think it stirred up. So there was no, there, it wasn't a rainstorm, right? No, I don't remember. There. No, there's no rain event. It was rain on the day that the uh, the complaint. It was it was raining the day that the neighbor took the photos, and oh, okay. they also broke the beaver down that same day. Oh. Um, but then you can see that there's two tributaries here on this left side. This is the tributary coming from 23 Cape. It's the lower part of this one. And then this is the Mill River coming from upstream. So that doesn't look good either. So, <laughs> yeah. so the photo to the left is the water coming off of Cape Road? Yeah. That, that photo, I can't, it doesn't look uh, murky to me, but is it? I can't really tell. No. There's definitely fine silts on the bottom, but whether or not that's historic from Last year, two years ago, I can't tell. There was definitely no breach in sediment controls or issues on site that I saw. Okay. Um, so, so there was a big beaver dam near the near the airport. Yeah, supposedly. Uh, uh. So, so what we have done proactively is we've contacted the abutter uh, who took the pictures and said, if they have a rain event and they see silt. Call Isabella, and if it's on a weekend, call me, and that way we will have eyes, and we can definitely see if it's coming from 23 Cape Road. Um, the other thing is that they've pulled out all the old culverts. All the culverts came from Gasco, the other warehouses, and from Cape Road itself. So all those culverts coming downhill have been pulled out now. So whether there's culverts in the bottom were dirty or not, they don't exist anymore. Okay. Um, their stormwater systems are in stormwater hmm. management. And then I'm going out tomorrow. They have two, um, they have their four detention basins installed. And so I'll be out tomorrow at 10. Was, was all that installed uh, prior to this event? This stormwater system was installed. However, they hadn't stopped this. The pond that was already existing out there was still collecting water. Okay. So that's been replaced um, since I've last been. Has okay. there been any more activity uh, coming from the solar field or or the uh, soccer field? So that, there was some question about water runoff coming down the soccer field because of the parking lot. And, Following down, hitting the first tension line, overflowing it, and then going down. Yeah. And that's why originally they put those extra retaining ponds down at the bottom of the hill. Yeah, it's not. It's not Cape Road though. Right. It, it's not it's 23 Cape Road. Say that again. Well, what's 23 Cape Road? What what property is that? Yeah, it's the it's the warehouse, yeah, the okay. soccer field, and solar. I mean, we're not pursuing. Right. I didn't know, like I said, with all the mud, whether or not it had anything to do with water from up above. No, because they're below stream. Um, and then I did get the the certification letter from Kimball Sand. So they're getting all the material from Kimball's and then other trucks are taking material off site. Yeah, one of the other questions we received from the letters was about the fill that is being trucked in by the dump truck load over and over. And so that has been posted on our website. We told the concerned citizens where they can find that documentation. It would be good to find out what's and where where that silt is coming from. Because well, that's what the certification is. No, the um, no, in the in the river. Oh, in the oh, river the silt. The silt, yeah, right. Yes, and and if it's if we if we can determine that it's not. 23 Cape Road, then Isabel, I sick Isabel and say, Isabella, please start working your way upstream and see whether it's coming yeah. from the airport or other butters. And so what we, the other thing to, that we need to rule out is every time there's a rain event, the existing siltation that was there from a couple of years ago is going to start flushing out down the river. 
And was that supposed to get cleaned out, but it isn't now? We're going to eventually, it, 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 at some point, get a replication, have them come back uh, with what their proposal is to do about it. Just blue they, water? Or now that blue water owns the property, they sort of, it, it, since we did not attach anything to the registry of deeds, it, got, it fell through the cracks. They thought the previous owner had done it and didn't realize that the previous owner hadn't done it until we went and told them that. So they, they at some point catch up with them and ask them what they're planning on doing. Um, these are the four detention ponds that have been constructed now. And so all these culverts that used to go down. Any other questions about 23 Cape Road? Okay. Now the things we had site walks about this morning. Agenda item 11, COC request for 73, Backstone, 73 Blackstone, DEP 2180839. Uh, we did the site report, the site visit, uh, and my I, to speed things up, I will speak from the chair the way I usually would. Uh, my recommendation is that we give this a partial because the grass hasn't grown in yet, and that we say that they have to come back in the spring for summer to demonstrate that they have sufficient ground cover. There's also uh, the bank that's, you know, they built a one-to-one -one slope on top of a pre-existing stone wall and it's starting to cave in. And there's also a couple places where we talked about having them put riprap in at the outfall of their French drains from the gutters and the foundation. They agreed to that. Uh, Bob, Isabella, do you have anything to add? Okay. Nope. It was, uh, the site was, was um, other than that, was in good shape. Yep. Okay. And uh, they are going to be, um, they are aware that some of their siltation and hay barriers, they have plastic in it. You know, I made a point of saying the hay gets to stay, but you have to pull out the plastic twine that was around the hay bales. And they, the builder was speaking to the contractor specifically saying that that needed to come out. So we will be able to follow up on that next spring when we uh, re review the partial. All right, so motion time. I make a motion to issue a partial certificate of compliance for 73 Blackstone Street, DEP number 218 0829. Is there a second? A second. Roll call. Tim? Tim, I. Bob, I. Based on our recommendation. Sorry, so I. Leah, I. And chair votes I, passes unanimously. Great. Uh, agenda item 12, certificate of compliance request for 75 Blackstone Street, DEP 218-0840. Um, this one, the grass, uh, they set up the limit of work uh, and the grass outside it is a well-established ground cover. Inside the limit of work, it looks stable. At some point, the we're, we're issuing the certificate of compliance for the builder. At some point, the homeowner may come in and ask for a notice of intent because they want to move their driveway from up there to down here. Uh, at which point they will, will will go through the whole application process with them. So the COC that we're issuing is to the builder on the as built. The, the site is kind of strange. There's the house has a two bay garage and it doesn't go to the road <laughs> because that's the way they built the house. So that is something that we may have them come back for at some point in the future. So they'll have to submit a new notice of intent. Yes, it'll be a new permit. Do you have any comments? No, um, again, they, they, they presented well. Okay, motion time. I make a motion to issue a, certifi a certificate of compliance for 75 Blackstone Street. 
BUP number 218840. There's a second. Hi, second. Hi, Bob. Roll call. Tim, aye. Bob, aye. Leah, aye. And chair votes yes. Great. See if we can finish. Four ten. Uh, agenda item thirteen: partial certificate of compliance request for three Freeman, three Freeman Place DEP two one eight dash zero five seven zero. This is a. Eh, I'll let you explain why the lawyer is saying we need to do this. This is a, a partial COC request because they're selling the house and the subdivision for Freeman or Park Place. OOC has not been closed. The property doesn't have wetlands on it. Um, so they just need the partial to be able to sell the house. This is the as built plan. As you can see, it's from 2006. Um, I don't know if Tim remembers why there's not closed, <laughs> but. What's the address on this one? This is Freeman Place or Park Place development. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you know the developer so that the, Mike, the developer Mike Curtala Curtala yeah. yeah uh that property the uh, that little cul-de-sac he walked away from and didn't finish and he lost his bond so it doesn't surprise me that they didn't get a certificate of compliance but I mean I think the thing is I mean how old is it now it's probably is it 10 years old or more 20 20 oh my 2000, god 2004 what the heck? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I haven't, I didn't go out there to look at this. Did somebody go? Did you guys go out there this after this morning or whatever? I went out. Um, I mean, it's, it's all thrown in. It's, it's a manicure yeah, it's a, now. You know? Yeah, there's no wetlands. There's no woods either. It's really just a lot. Um, it was probably the, so. What is is the road order a condition encumbering this person's property? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's. I think we should just move it forward and. If the lawyer thinks it'll help, then let's help the homeowner. I think it's fine, fine to issue the partial for her and get her closed, but I don't know if I should try to find, I don't know how I would close the 2004 permit or just leave it, I guess. We wait for uh -huh. someone to come to us or or the town says they're going to accept the road and ask us to do the, the road is accepted. Though. Yeah, the road's accepted. So why can't we close the, the total order, the, the other one? He hasn't requested it. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, it's if we know it's not going to, <laughs> if we know it's open, why don't we close it? Because it's going to affect somebody, another homeowner at some point. But I don't know, whatever, whatever the board thinks. We'll, we'll add this. Do you, that later, though. We'll add to your backlog. <laughs> things to, when you get around to it. Attorney North. That'll be on the very bottom of the list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments or questions? I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to issue a partial certificate of compliance for three Freeman Place DEP number 218-0570. Is there a second? I'll second. Great. Roll call. Tim, I. Bob, I. Sue, I. Leah, I. Chair, I. Passes unanimously. All right. Um, 14 agenda item 14 the maple farm wildlife preserve the otherwise known as the vandersluss property uh review the baseline documentation report for the conservation restriction uh i looked through the 140 or so pages it's a very nice document uh describing exactly lots and lots of photographs and nice uh, they had a professional bird watcher come in and categorize 70 or so species of birds. That's oh, wow. nice things. That's how comprehensive this thing is. And that it, was an old, that was old that the Vandersloos had done in the 2000s because yeah. they were trying to protect it. Right. They've been trying to protect this property for 25 years. Yep. So uh, this is going, we don't have to do any action with it. It will be useful when we go out with, um, Metacomet and do a site walk once a year and, and look at. So that's the purpose of the baseline document. All right, uh, updates, chair. Um, not at 10 of 10, I don't. <laughs> Late Nipmuc Task Force. We heard from them that there's going to be a meeting. Talk about something in two weeks. Yeah, they're looking to um, 
get some relief for loose strife uh, yep. eradication. So if you work, uh, and they're concerned with the height of the lake. Yep. The lake is at a very low. We need a few hurricanes. So, <laughs> so work with Isabella on coming up with the wording of the agenda item and exactly what we're going to be talking about. And if we're going to think about allocating any money to make sure that's written. In the agenda. Uh, Peter's not here. I know the land use committee met and we'll hear from about it next time. Um, um, we do have two new applications for next meeting. It's going to be 14, uh, 14 Lundball, uh, drive. They recently went through ZBA, um, and then oh. Lundball. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. And then 13 B Asylum Street, they are reapplying because they don't have an order of conditions. Is so that that's that's the, where they just cut in for the new road? And so what does that mean? They need to reapply because they don't have an order of conditions. So they just cut that road. They thought they had it. They got approval from the commission. The commission failed to issue an order. Another one. Okay, so we have to catch up on the paperwork. Uh, what's the status of the. Um, Especially since it's priority municipal well project. They cleared the trees this week. They had police detail for all the work going in and all the work coming out. Everything's down. They they pulled out all the equipment this afternoon. I believe next week they start the pump test. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Are you ready? Are you comfortable with the minutes or do you want to have us review them and then approve them? If we do this? I didn't share them with you all to review, so okay. I would we'll wait it off for two weeks then. All right, so passing by 16, 17, anybody want to verbal for the next couple of minutes? Good and welfare for the commission. Okay. Uh, items not anticipated. Agenda 19, I'm willing to entertain a motion. I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. Second. And seconded. All in roll call vote. No, I think we should stay for another half hour or so just to you know go over some stuff, more stuff, you know. No, sorry, no discussion. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. Okay, chair votes yes because he wants to get home. So Ooh. contested vote denied. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. yeah see you. Like see you in two weeks. Tim, do you want to come in and sign sign yeah, them can. again? I can. Sure. I'll leave them.